Sergeant? Uh, Sergeant, are, you, are we ready? Good afternoon and welcome to the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management hearing on the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor's management report for the Department of Sanitation and the Business Integrity Commission. My name is Antonio Reynoso and I am the chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Today we will hear testimony from the Department of Sanitation on its expense budget, capital plan, and general agency operations. After we hear from DSNY, we will hear from the Business Integrity Commission on its expense budget and general agency operations. The Department of Sanitation's fiscal 2019 budget totals $1.71 billion expense budget, which is $34.5 million more than fiscal 2018 adopted budget. DSNY's commitment plan for fiscal 2018 through 2022 totals approximately $2.17 billion an increase of $42.1 million, or 2% since the last budget adoption. The committee looks forward to discussing such important topics as the efforts to align the city with achieving its goal of zero waste by 2030, a status update on the electronics collection and clean NYC program, and discussing the various new needs included in the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget. The Business Integrity Commission's fiscal 2019 expense budget totals $8.6 million, which is $123,000 less than fiscal year 2018 adopted budget. The committee looks forward to hearing the department's testimony on important topics, including enforcement efforts targeting unlicensed waste haulers, as well as agency performance in reviewing applications. We will first hear from Commissioner Garcia of the Department of Sanitation and then proceed to hear from Commissioner Brownell of the Business Integrity Commission. The committee will then hear from members of the public. We thank you in advance for your patience. I would like to thank our committee staff, including our financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, Nicole Abeni, uh, legal counsel to the committee, and our policy analyst, Nadia Johnson, as well as my own staff, Jennifer Gutierrez and Asher Freeman. Uh, before we hear uh, Commissioner Garcia's uh, testimony, I would like to acknowledge my, coll my colleagues who are present, uh, Councilman Heim Deutsch from Brooklyn. Welcome, Heim. Uh, at this point, I uh, want to Yes, absolutely. So um, we're just going to swear you in before the beginning of testimony. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please begin your testimony. Thank you. You know, when I started this job, I did not need reading glasses. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso, members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the department's portion of the mayor's fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget, the fiscal 2018 preliminary mayor's management report, and our current programs and operations. With me this afternoon are Stephen Costas, First Deputy Commissioner, and Larry Cipollina, Deputy Commissioner for Administration and Financial Management. As proposed, the fiscal year 19 preliminary budget allocates $1.71 billion in operating funds for the department to perform our core mission of keeping New York City healthy, safe, and clean by collecting and managing more than 11,000 tons of refuse and recyclables per day, cleaning streets and vacant lots, and clearing snow and ice. In addition, the department's proposed fiscal year 19 capital budget is approximately $407 million. Of this amount, $301 million is allocated to facility construction and rehabilitation, $13 million for information technology projects, and $93 million for replacement of vehicles and equipment. The proposed fiscal 19 budget also ensures the de department's ability to complete the implementation of the city's comprehensive solid waste management plan, advance our ambitious and expanding sustainability programs, and continue closure construction at the Fresh Kills landfill. Clean streets and public spaces instill a sense of neighborhood pride and contribute to a high quality of life for New Yorkers. I am proud of the men and women of the department who work hard to deliver essential sanitation services daily in all five boroughs. In fiscal year 2017, the department achieved a record 95.9 .9 citywide average scorecard rating, the highest in the history of the scorecard rating program. Through January of fiscal 18, the department has achieved a citywide average scorecard rating of 94.7%. The fiscal 19 budget continues funding for the mayor's Clean NYC initiative, 
which includes expanded Sunday and holiday litter basket collection service and mechanical sweeping of approximately 100 miles of highway ramps and shoulders each week. In addition, as we discussed last week, the preliminary budget allocates 3.2 million in fiscal 18 and 2.3 million in fiscal 19 related to the mayor's neighborhood rat reduction initiative. Last summer, the department released Talk Trash, a video marketing campaign encouraging New Yorkers to do their share by putting litter where it goes, in a litter basket. We released this campaign with an event at the cage, the iconic basketball courts at West 4th Street in the Greenwich Village and have distributed litter baskets painted to look like basketball hoops in parks and playgrounds across the city. I am pleased to share that video with you now, because I did such a terrible job actually describing it in words the last time I uh, testified. Dude, <laughs> come on, man. Come on! You call that a shot? This ain't a game. Mm, I'm talking to you. You were two feet away from the bucket, and you still missed the shot. You didn't even try. Talk trash, New York. Litter trashes our town. Garbage reaches sewers, then floats to our beaches. Yeah. If you see someone littering, tell them where to put it. Talk trash, New York. Thank you. Uh, so we have been promoting this on social media and at events across the city. Clearing snow and ice during winter weather ensures safe travel on the city's 19,000 lane miles of roadways. In fiscal 19, the department's proposed preliminary snow budget is approximately 83.1 million. Snow, sleet, and freezing rain fell on our streets on eight separate occasions this winter so far. It is not over till April. The city also experienced one of the longest streaks of, be uh, streaks of below freezing temperatures in recorded history this past January. The adopted snow budget for fiscal 18 is 84.1 million, though our estimated expenditures now stand at approximately 86.1 million to date for this snow season through the end of February before the last three storms. The official total snowfall accumulations for the city during the 2017-18 snow season currently stand at 27 inches, and to date this season we have used 392-333 tons of road salt. We are currently Sorry, <laughs> I was like, who's talking behind me? Uh, we are working to complete development of the long-term infrastructure component of the city's comprehensive solid waste management plan, a fair five-borough plan that relies on sustainable rail barge-based transport and reduces the impact of waste management on historically overburdened neighborhoods. The fiscal 2019 preliminary budget allocates $411 million in export tipping fees for the department's long-term export operations and current interim export operations. Today, seven of the nine long-term disposal facilities called for in the swamp are operating. Three years ago, the department opened the North Shore Marine Transfer Station in College Point, Queens, the first of four converted marine transfer stations to be completed. Last spring, the department completed the contracting process for the transfer, transport, and disposal of containerized waste from the Hamilton Avenue and Southwest Brooklyn Marine Transfer Stations, and Hamilton Avenue MTS began operating last September. Currently, that facility manages up to 960 tons per day. By September of this year, the Hamilton Avenue MTS will be accepting approximately 1,600 tons per day. I am excited to inform this committee that by the end of fiscal 19, the Southwest Brooklyn Marine Transfer Station and the East 91st Marine Transfer Station will be completed. The preliminary budget includes 12 additional maintenance staff, three at each MTS, to support these facilities going forward. The completion of these facilities is the final step in implementing the city's long-term waste export program under the Solid Waste Management Plan. The initiatives outlined in the Solid Waste Management Plan will reduce truck traffic in and around New York City by more than 5 million miles per year, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 34,000 tons per year, and contribute to a more equitable distribution of waste management infrastructure in New York City. The department also continues to work toward important reforms to the city's commercial waste system as well. Last year, the department and BIC began working with a broad group of stakeholders, including businesses, the private carting industry, and environmental justice advocates to move toward commercial waste zones in New York City. 
With the help of a team of consultants, the department is developing an implementation plan that will lay out a framework for establishing commercial waste zone collections to achieve our goal of creating a safe and efficient system to manage waste for New York City businesses that emphasizes high quality, low cost, and sets the city's commercial waste sector on a pathway to zero waste. We look forward to continuing our work with the City Council and stakeholders in this important process. The preliminary budget also reflects our commitment to achieving our, our zero waste goals by 2030. This budget allocates a total of $60.3 million in fiscal 19 to the Department's Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability for waste prevention, recycling, and sustainability programs, including outreach and education, organics and community composting, textiles, electronic waste, harmful household products, reuse and donations, and zero waste schools, in addition to our recycling processing costs. The Department continues to expand our New York City Organics Curbside Collection Program. When the program began as a pilot in 2013, there were 3,500 households participating in the program. As of the end of 2017, the program serves more than 3.3 million New Yorkers. Today, 22 community districts have curbside organics collection, and we will continue expanding this service this year. Buildings in the remaining 20 community districts, which are high-density districts in Manhattan and the Bronx, can sign up online to receive organics collection service. Earlier this month, the department added our first cohort of Bronx high-rise buildings. In the last year, we have also increased the number of food waste drop-off sites citywide to 97. These new sites are part of Compost on the Go, launched in partnership with Grow NYC to expand food scrap drop-off op opportunities in underserved areas in Manhattan and the Bronx. By the end of 2018, the department will achieve our goal of expanding New York City organics to serve all New Yorkers through curbside collection or convenient neighborhood drop-off sites. The preliminary budget also allocates $117,500 in fiscal 18 and $70,000 in fiscal 19 to support the development and implementation of a food donation portal pursuant to Local Law 176 of 2017. The department is currently on track to launch the food donation portal by March 2019, deadline specified in the local law. The department is also working with our partners, Housing Works and ERI, to expand our refashion NYC and eCycle NYC programs in apartment buildings. As of January 2018, there are nearly 150,000 households across the city have access to the refashion program, which has collected and diverted more than 12 million pounds of textiles for reuse and recycling. The eCycle NYC program is the most expansive electronic waste collection service offered by any municipality in the country. Since its inception in 2013, eCycle's NYC apartment program has grown to serve more than 800,000 households across the city. In 2017, the department also expanded curbside e-waste collection to districts in North Brooklyn. This fall, we will expand that service to the rest of Brooklyn and Western Queens. The department continues to encourage residents to attend its safe disposal events, utilize its special waste drop-off sites, or take advantage of existing take-back options for the disposal of their unwanted electronic waste. Once again this spring, we will host safe disposal events, one in each borough. New Yorkers can find out more about these events on our website or by calling 311. In closing, I wish to thank Chair Renoso and the other members of this committee for continuing to work as a close partner and for your commitment to our work. Your support is critical to our ability to achieve our mission to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. Thank you for this opportunity to testify this afternoon. I am now happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we're going to ask a couple of questions, and then we're going to get to a couple of slides that I just want to go through with you. Um, so we can get clear, clear details regarding the zero waste um, initiatives or initiative. Um, so first, uh, the preliminary plan includes $462,000 um, in fiscal year 2018 to expand the food scrap drop-off program. Um, have we determined all the locations as to where that, that will happen? No, we have not determined. We're working with our partners, but we're very open. If you think there's a good site that we should be uh, focused on, um, but we're excited, but we really do usually need to work with partners to okay. understand what the community's needs are and where we'll be most successful. Okay, great. So I want to just open it up to allowing for maybe council member input um, as to where these drop-off locations can be. Yeah. Um, because I do think it's a, it's a program that is very successful, and I think uh, a lot of council members would be encouraged to use it. I want to encourage council members to use it. 
Um, of the food uh, scrap drop-off locations, are we adding any to the existing network? And what is the total number of locations per borough? So there are 97 food drop-off locations currently. Uh, 15 are in Brooklyn, 17 are in the Bronx, 45 are in Manhattan, in part because that's where they started. Mm -hmm. 17 are in Queens, and three are in Staten Island. Okay. Um, so adding this, fun this funding, how much additional tonnage do we anticipate collecting? It's really very dependent on our participation. We've seen some locations where we will get you know, two, three, four tons, and then some locations where there's been less participation. All right, so what, what are the, I guess, the communities with the highest, or where are the communities with the highest return? Well, the highest tonnage? return has been, you know, Union Square, right. uh, okay. uh, Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn, but the ones that were very new last year in Upper Manhattan were very successful, uh, and we got a uh, good tonnage out of those. The ones in the Bronx, we're looking at whether or not we need to move those sites around uh, and partner more closely with some of the community gardens up there to get more material. Okay, so you've identified the problems that you've had or operational challenges, and one of those is just maybe siting? Is siting, is, is understanding how people are moving around and like, are we going to the right subway station where people are relatively close and willing to bring their food to you? Or is this something where you know, what's the pedestrian habits and what, ha you know, how are we going to engage with the public? Uh, and so in some areas that's, you know, we've, we've hit the nail on the head. Uh, in other areas, we're going to look at perhaps moving them around to see whether or not we can get better participation. Okay. Um, so commercial way zones, very important topic here in the City Council and in the City of New York, I want to say. Um, can we just get an update as to the status of the plan and, and the conversations that are happening and the, the interaction between the Department of Sanitation and I guess communities in, in, in educating and informing them of exactly what will or can happen. Uh, just a general update. Yeah, certainly. I mean, so this is obviously a huge undertaking that we're doing in partnership with BIC, but it really is much broader than that. We brought on a consulting firm. We have done, they have done over a hundred engagements with uh, stakeholders that range from large real estate to bids to the private card and community specifically, um, uh, to advocates in the environmental justice community, and so really taking the input from all of those stakeholders as we start to put together what will be an implementation plan that we will, of course, bring to the council. Um, we will go back to our advisory board of about 40, and really it's pretty open to anyone who'd like to attend. Um, you, I know you've been to at least one. Uh, I encourage your colleagues, if they would like to join the board, to we would be we would love to have them, um, and then we will take back and like they've done a couple of they're working on finalizing a couple of different models, and take that to the board for their input, and then we'll do the final design. But it's very iterative, um, uh, in terms of taking you know what is it what do, what do big businesses what do small businesses need. Um, what is the carding community able to do and to make sure that they can be sustainable in the long run? Uh, how do we really get safety embedded in all of this? Uh, we want to make sure that we're achieving a broad range of goals for the city of New York. So can for the new members and maybe for some folks watching at home or in here, can just the, the basis by which we've come to a, an understanding that way zones, waste collection zones might make sense, um, can you just refer a little bit to the study uh, and why we think that this might be um, a, a solution or an option um, to, I guess, uh, mostly speaking about VMTs. So just oh, absolutely. And so we undertook a study, uh, I guess we completed it probably close to a year ago, in which we really looked at the industry. And I, I don't think that anyone had looked at the industry in a very long time uh, beyond what was required under the permits that BIC provides. And one of the things that we found is, first of all, that the carding industry is heavily concentrated with just a few firms controlling the vast majority of the market. Um, about the top five firms control 50 percent of both the customer base as well as the revenue share. Uh, and when you get to the top 20, it's around uh, 80 percent of that. In addition, what we found was that um, in the first analysis, anywhere from a 49 to a 68 percent decrease in vehicle miles traveled when we expanded to include all carters, which hadn't been, they'd only looked at the top 20 in the first analysis, and up to 75 percent reduction in vehicle miles traveled. Um, you know, obviously, 
that's designing an absolutely perfect system, but really making it so that uh, the routes aren't extraordinarily long. One of the things that happens in the private carding industry is it is very highly competitive. And so the, the, the objective is always to fill up the truck. And so if you need to go 10 miles further north to go get that last ton, you add that to the route. Uh, and so the routes are highly, highly inefficient. And just by creating boundaries around what happens uh, within a zone, you see a significant reduction in vehicle miles traveled. Okay, so, and for just a little bit of uh, background, in North Brooklyn, for example, uh, we have a lot of vehicles miles traveled because we handle about 40% of the city's trash. It happens in the South Bronx, it happens in Southeast Queens. Those are three districts that bear the burden of handling a lot of the city's uh, private trash and, and general trash. Um, and uh, when we saw this study, uh, we've been crying foul for a long time, and this study, this study justified um, a lot of our concerns, which was that these routes were extremely inefficient. When we're talking about a perfect system can get us to 75% more efficiency, right, and, a, and, a, and I guess a conservative number, let's say 48% more efficient, um, it, it's definitely something we want to look at. So I'm glad that the study kind of justified the need to look as, uh, in, at the private industry and see if we can do, a be uh, do better at being more efficient with vehicles miles traveled and try to bring down these asthma rates in these communities, mostly of color, um, again, in Brooklyn, Bronx, and Queens. So um, I'm extremely grateful that that study happened and I'm looking, I'm looking forward to continuing to be a, in the board uh, and trying to find solutions for that. And I am going to encourage members of this uh, committee to be a part of that board so they could start learning uh, about what's happening with waste zones and eventually hopefully being partners in making it happen here in the city of New York. Yeah. Um, so we have $118,000 in fiscal 2018 and 120 in 2019 to create a web portal to connect prospective food donors and recipients of food waste. Um, uh, I just want to know the development of that portal. Is it going to be outsourced or insourced? I just want to. Uh, so we have decided that we're going to insource this, incorporate it into our Donate NYC website and continue to promote uh, sort of that as the hub for all things donation related. Uh, we already have very a lot of partners, you know, from organizations you know like Goodwill or Housing Works, um, but we want to make it so that what we do now on there is also going to apply to food. So um, we're excited about it. So the 118,000, is that salary work then? Is it paying for a salary or? What exactly, is it personnel? Well, it's, it's salary, it's uh, certificates, it's, you know, servers, it's all of that stuff. All right, so it encompasses all, including salary, including the person. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, in fiscal year 2018, the budget response, uh, in our budget response, we called for increased funding for radio advertisements um, and general advertisements uh, to spread the word about achieving zero waste in New York City by 2030, as well as to have the administration establish a set of benchmarks leading to zero waste and include in the preliminary uh, mayor's management report. This funding was never included, um, nor was the PMMR recommendation. I personally feel not enough is being done to inform New Yorkers about this ambitious goal, and we need to get the word out. So I, I just kind of want to put it in perspective. Uh, there is vision zero for uh, the DOT in trying to uh, prevent crashes and deaths in the, uh, prevent deaths in the city of New York related to vehicle, vehicles. And then we have uh, Zero Waste, which is another initiative by uh, the, uh, this administration. Now, the funding given for advertisements to educate the public for Vision Zero is about $10 million. Um, and your entire budget for education and information is two, uh, just above $2 million. So when we talk about one initiative getting $10 million, and then an entire department getting $2 million, um, I just really feel uh, uncomfortable with our ability to truly educate the public on how we're going to achieve zero waste or on initiatives that you're taking to achieve zero waste. Just want your response as to um, whether or not, uh, it, for me, it, it seems like the administration is not taking this initiative seriously when it doesn't budget you the right amount of money to actually start addressing the issues and the initiative itself. All right. No, I mean, I, I understand how you, you may perceive it that way. Um, you know, we do a lot of outreach and education that are actual people on the ground explaining what we're doing as we're rolling out new programs. Uh, 
you know, tens of thousands of actual conversations with New Yorkers. Uh, in addition, we do some very localized uh, outreach, sort of the local paper, um, you know, the Queen's Courier, one of those, uh, to try and get the message out. We don't have a budget for very expensive things, say, uh, subway advertising or something like that. Um, but we do, uh, we do get free space, uh, and we try and maximize our free space whenever we can. Uh, so, you know, I'm always hopeful that we are getting the word out. I, I sort of live and breathe the zero waste stuff every day, so I'm always surprised that everyone doesn't know. Um, but, you know, we continue to try and make uh, be as effective as possible at getting the word out and getting and engaging people. Um, particularly as we've been in the middle of some of our programs, micro-targeting. $25 million Well, we could, maybe we'll just do $25 million. Um, uh, has been appropriate because we're in some cases we're not citywide, so it could be a confusing message if we have services available for some people but not for other people. Uh, but, you know, we are hopeful that we are effectively dealing with it through sort of this more micro targeting of, of communities, um, but you're correct. We do not have a large advertising budget. Okay, and I just want to, we, we're in a bubble. We, we are trash people. Uh, we're and trash groupies. Are garbage folks. We're right? garbage we, groupies. <laughs> we care about this, but for the general public, vis, um, uh, zero waste is, is, they've never even heard of it. And I, and I, and I would challenge just a, a New Yorker in the street to ask them about uh, zero waste and whether or not they have any reference to it. But now Vision Zero, because of the commercials they see on TV, because of all the actions that are taken, um, is in the front lines of their minds and of, of, of an initiative that is being taken seriously. I would even challenge my council members to be able to tell me whether or not they've felt um, that our messaging regarding zero waste has resonated in their communities. Um, and it ha I don't believe it has in mine. And I think that you're, you do very well with the little you receive. And you're being extremely humble um, in, in not requesting for more necessarily, but understand its value. But I, I'm not going to be that person. I'm going to let you know that you need more money so that we can get this word out. And I'm actually going to be making a recommendation um, in a city council response for a $10 million budget for advertising so we can start addressing zero waste more seriously. Um, I don't think it's happening right now. And again, I want to call on my colleagues to, to support me in that, but also uh, I challenge them to, to let me know if they've seen zero waste advertising. Um, and, and it would be difficult for them to, uh, well, I would assume that it would be difficult to find um, uh, that they have. Uh, so now we have a couple of slides uh, back to, to zero waste that I want to go to. The first slide that we see here is uh, the trend. And this is, I, I want to say, this is the goal of Vision Zero, of zero Waste, right? It's 100% diversion rates. Mm -hmm. What we want to get to is no trash going to landfills by 2030. Uh, if you look at the red line, uh, moving forward, this is the rate by which we would have to start um, diverting trash to get to that goal. The trend is, is actually a, what we would consider um, a, f a friendly trend uh, angled here that shows that uh, what we will reach maybe 40% uh, if we're ambitious at the rate that we're going. Um, this, is, this is more uh, to do two things. One, address the issue of how serious the administration is taking zero waste. We're very concerned that that's not happening and that you're not getting the support that you need to be able to truly ad address this issue. Um, the trend is something that it seems more realistic to us in the council as opposed to the goal. Um, so I would just like to ask you to present us what you believe the Department of Sanitation and this administration is doing to achieve this goal, considering what we've seen over the last four years, which is more in line with this trend. So, so there are a couple of pieces that are really going to be critical to achieving this. I mean, one of them is clearly getting the organics collection citywide. I mean, if we do not, if we do not really push that program, we won't get there. Um, continuing to push many of our other programs, including electronic waste and textiles, um, there are good programs out there. There are a significant percentage of our waste stream, particularly textiles. Uh, but we need to get people participating in them. Uh, you know, another piece of it is, and I'll put this back on the council, you know, 
where is the plastic bag ban? Where is the styrofoam ban? I mean, I think that those are, you know, there are pieces of the puzzle that we assumed would no longer be part of the waste stream at this point in time. Um, and so I would, I would say that that is something that we need to continue to identify where there are products that they're, they're just not good solutions for in terms of recycling. Um, and then we really are planning to move towards single stream. We think that that will have uh, a step change in terms of making it easier for New Yorkers. Um, we hope to move forward with f trying to figure out a way to give people incentives for recycling more. Um, also a step change. And so those are some of the big pieces. In addition, we're, we will have to continue to focus on NYCHA. Uh, they are a big piece of this as well. We have made some progress in that area. The infrastructure is now available, which had not ever been true, uh, but how to engage with, with that community and figure out how to get material from them. Um, so there are a lot of pieces that we think can really B step changes in, in how we get there, but we do need to make sure that we are committed to the programs and, and committed to continuing to push this forward. Um, it is not going to be easy, and none of it is necessarily going to be um, always the most fun to get done or make you the most popular. But I do think that it is achievable, um, and hopefully, you will continue to be my partner in this. Yes. So I am going to be your partner, but I want to be a real partner. I want, to, I want to make sure that when we talk about zero waste, that we're doing everything we can to, to help achieve that. And at this point, I think I'm being unfair to you by not letting you know that we need you to have a lot more money uh, invested into this initiative so we can start making a dent and, and truly start changing things. And I will be an advocate fighting against plastic bags and styrofoam while I'm here um, as an individual, as a chair, um, I know other council members might have different thoughts about it, but I understand the value of having zero waste go to landfills. And I do want to say, just for my colleagues as well, uh, we spend about four, over $400 million every year to send trash, uh, to export trash to landfills. Now, the, it was, when I first started here, I think it was uh, barely $300 million. And in four years, we've seen an exponential increase. At that rate, it's going to cost us a billion dollars before 2030 to export trash if we don't get to zero waste. And that billion dollars is going to have to happen because people don't want to see trash in their streets. They're going to, we're going to have to be forced to pay that. Um, and if we ever come into like an economic crisis, that money can't be moved. The exporting of waste is a, a baseline that can never be touched because we need to get rid of the trash. The money is then going to come from our children's after school programming, our senior centers, um, our schools, our libraries, and all these other important uh, institutions um, that make us great and who we are. But that would all go to waste, no pun intended, because we actually have to export it, export it at possibly a billion dollars in the near future at the rate that I see this going. So I just want to put it in perspective about how much money we spend exporting trash. The faster we get to that goal, the less money we spend on that and the more money we spend on taking care of our communities. So the next slide, that I, that I want to go to before. I'm going to get to questions for my colleagues right after this. Um, this, is, this is the zero waste uh, initiative, uh, the zero waste initiative through 1NYC. This is how much we have, which is $28.6 million that we're spending uh, to get all this stuff done. Um, and one, again, I want $28.6 million for an entire budget uh, related to achieving an initiative. This is just twice as much as, as, as well, to put it in perspective, this pales in comparison to other initiatives in the city of New York that I believe are taken serious by the mayor. Um, so The only thing I'd like to point out on this is yes. that it does not include the operating costs of the programs. So how much it costs to do the collection for organics, for example. Okay. So that's the, that's the outreach and educational and uh, the bins and that, so, so those sort of pieces of the program. Oh, so you would see this as an incomplete uh, snapshot at the programmatic budget, uh, at the budget. This is programmatic, right, but not operational. Right, not the operational side. Okay, I respect this. So I, I, I'm going to make sure that next time we have a more clearer one that speaks to operation as well. Um, so as seen on this chart, of course, is $28.3 million for the one New York City initiatives. Um, with respect to fiscal year 2019, how much funding is included for these efforts? Do you know the change from 2018 to 2019? 
It, it's more or less the same. I don't, I don't think that there's anything in there that's significantly different. There's some programs that are a little up and down, but um, for example, the Save As You Throw consultant won't be repeating, uh, but other than that, it's, it's pretty much baseline. Uh, the only thing is there may be, uh, we're still doing the projections of once we get through this particular outreach season on organics, what our uh, organic bin purchases will need to be. Because uh, obviously, once we, they're, they're a one-time cost that don't need to happen every year annually. So when I see, when you, you talked about organics, electronic waste, and textiles, plastic bags, styrofoam, single stream, um, and NYCHA work, I just want to make sure that when we tackle those issues, for example, the NYCHA recycles is um, just $270,000. I think that, mu that, <laughs> that amount is extremely low if we really want to make a dent in an area that is traditionally seen almost no recycling. Um, because of the lack of infrastructure that we're trying to work on. So just again, I really feel uncomfortable talk, letting the public know or, or talking to the public about zero waste when we're talking about $28.26 million for a programmatic budget, you know, less than $2 million for your entire advertising budget, not just for um, zero waste. It's just, um, I think we're being a little dishonest uh, if, uh, about the seriousness of this initiative if we're not budgeting it the right way. Um, now, before I go on to my colleagues, there's gonna be my last question. Um, so I'm going to ask you, do you believe with the budget that you have, we would actually be on track uh, to close this 80% gap that we have regarding diversion rates uh, in the city of New York? I think that, that given what uh the programs that we have laid out, some of which will need additional funding in out years, uh, that we can get there. Uh, but we are going to need your support on some of the other pieces of it. Um, but I think that this is something we can do. But it will require additional funding, likely, uh, in the coming fiscal years, for, for primarily for operations-related related costs. OK, and I, and I look forward to getting that, that amount of uh, what the operational cost would be, um, because I want to start talking about this in a serious way. The last four years, I really felt like we didn't make enough progress. Um, I feel like a lot of initiatives are falling short, and I just really, again, do not feel that this administration is taking this initiative serious. Um, I want to um, open it up to colleagues. Uh, I want to acknowledge them. Uh, first, Rafael Espinal from Brooklyn, Paul Vallone from Queens, Fernando Cabrera from the Bronx, and again, Heim Deutsch from Brooklyn. and. Um, want to ask Councilmember Chaim Deutsch uh, be the first to ask questions. We'll have a, a five minute clock. It's a, it's a fake clock. Uh, if you need more time, we'll just give it to you. Uh, we just really want to be concise um, in, in uh, tackling a lot of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, so first I wanted to, uh, first I want to bring up, um, you mentioned uh, in your testimony there's $1.71 billion in operating costs in the budget uh, to keep our streets clean. Uh, do you agree that in order to properly keep our streets clean 100%, we would need more funding in the budget? Well, I would actually turn the question around and say, if I had citizens who did not litter, I would be in great shape. Um, and the challenge, though, is always keeping up with what New Yorkers, as actually is in a national article today about uh, how folks feel about this is uh, we are the only people who keep picking up after you even when your mother stops. Um, and so can I keep the streets 100% clean 100% of the time? No, I don't think there's any amount of money that you could give me that would make it so that I could tell you that that was true unless I had uh, a citizenry that was a little bit more respectful of the law and of their fellow citizens. So my next question is that do you feel that you need more money in the budget for city sanitation to keep our streets clean and try its best to keep our streets clean by picking up trash after holidays, picking up corner waste baskets seven days a week, 100 percent, or the best of your ability? So, I mean, I do think that it would be helpful to have additional litter basket service, primarily just because New York City is booming. Um, and, and that is going to be an ongoing challenge. There are just more and more and more people here. And parts of the city that were never busy are busy and busy all the time. So, I mean, I do think that that's something. Um, 
you know, you and I, I think, disagree about holiday collection. Holiday collection, I don't think, is a significant challenge. And this is partly personal, and I've been a Monday for 21 years now, and I've never found it to be significant, and that cost is extraordinary. So I don't think the balance necessarily is there. I think on Litter Basket, there's always, um, you know, it, it's very, very visible. Uh, it's you know challenging with how quickly the city is changing, and so you know we're constantly looking at that uh, to make sure we're matching our services to where the people are, um, and so that is a that's a constant change uh, all the time. So I just want to bring up what I brought up the last hearing. So if someone has a collection on a Monday and the holiday falls on a Monday, then you have to wait for your trash to be picked up several days later. And at times, it, not at times, all the time, only 70% of that district gets picked up. 30% does not get picked up till the following week. So you always have the 30% because there's not enough funding, there's not enough manpower, and maybe there's not enough equipment. Secondly, if you have recycling and it falls on a Monday, you have to wait one full week. So you have to keep that recycling in your house, and many people have no room, so they place it outside, which leaves uh, recycling trash outside in the front of your home. Uh, in addition to that, if there's a holiday that falls out on two Mondays in a row, do you have to wait two full recycling um, uh, pickups mm -hmm. to get your recycling picked up, which leaves trash out in the street. In addition to that, we don't get uh, pickup, we don't get pickup for corner waste baskets in commercial districts. We have, I don't know how many commercial districts in our city, and those baskets are overflowing because we do not get seven days a week. We need seven days a week, and in some areas we need more than one time a day to be picked up. So when we set a good example to, our, um, to the residents of the city of New York to say, yes, we are doing our job, we are keeping our city clean, now it's your turn to keep your city clean. We're talking about styrofoam ban, plastic ban, plastic bag charge, organics collection, e-waste programs, $32 million to tackle um, rodent inf infestation in our city. But I think what we need to do is, is not go three quarters of our duty to pick up trash and then to give more um, work to everyone and to, and to try to ban everything. So we have to fully fund sanitation and once we have that, then we could go to the residents of our city and say, okay, we have pickups, uh, we're fully funded, and now this is what we would like to do and work your way down and to see how we can save more money all around. For example, salt. Uh, before a uh, snow emergency, uh, all the BKs have salt. How much salt goes to waste if there's a rain and your salt is sitting outside? It's not in the storage area. So we don't know how much salt goes to waste if it rains before a snowstorm while the salt is sitting outside the garage. Do we have any numbers on that of how much salt goes to waste? Does the salt need a storage area for it to be properly um, uh, salvaged to make sure everything is there? Do you, have a, do you have a cost on how much salt goes to waste? I think your mic might be off, is it? Um. So if we're talking about salt, when we salt ahead of a storm, we start salting at first flake. Um, even if there is not uh, snow that is accumulating, we do think that it creates a brine on the street and gives us a little bit more time uh, to reduce the amount of overall accumulations. Uh, in many places, we have salt that is in salt sheds. If not, we have tarp covers that are then opened for the season. Um, we have to make sure that we manage the sites appropriately, but we do not think that there is a significant loss of salt uh, because the site's uncovered during loading opportunities or when it rains. Is there a loss of salt? Well, I'm, my salt dissolves, so I'm going to say that it, eventually if you add Definitely water, have. salt will, salt will how dissolve. How much do we pay, uh, how much does the city pay for salt? At I believe a, that it's about $71 a ton. And how many tons do we usually, you know what the numbers are, the total numbers? So the total numbers of what we used so far this season was a little bit over 300,000 tons, about 320, but I don't think that includes the last three storms. The highest year, for instance, I've been in this chair, my largest year was 522,000 tons of salt. That's a lot of money. That was a lot of money. There were a lot of storms. Yes, there's a lot of money for having the salt to sit outside, exposed. Well, no, no, that was, that was to use the salt. Okay. That was to use, we spread so the we, salt. So we do have waste. 
on salt? No, I actually would, I would disagree with you. I do not think that our salt operations are wasteful. I think that they are appropriate for what the city needs to do in order to make sure that we are maintaining a safe environment. Thank you. You also mentioned in your testimony that uh, $93 million to replace equipment. Uh, what does it mean replace equipment? Does this mean adding equipment or just replacing equipment? No, this is, this is primarily re replacing equipment. And this year, it's uh, primarily mechanical brooms, uh, uh, CFC trucks, boom trucks. We actually did a pre-purchase um, in this fiscal year and bought uh, 250 rear loaders and 196 dual bins just because the contract price was going to go up and we wanted to save some money. Uh, so this is all just replacement uh, vehicles at this point in time. We are not planning to increase our fleet size overall at this moment. Now, uh, speaking about uh, mechanical street sweepers, does, does those street sweepers have the capacity uh, to carry trash? I mean, they, well, they sweep up the trash and it's kept inside the... Is there like an area in... There's an area inside. It's like a vacuum cleaner. So it almost is like, as you think of a vacuum cleaner bag, it has that sort of uh, compartment in it. Because I think years back when the street sweepers uh, drove down the commercial areas, they used to take sometimes the corner waste baskets and open that compartment and throw the trash in there? I don't, I don't, ha I, I've never heard of that and... So maybe we should, if we could look into that to see, because if the street sweepers are driving, are going down the commercial areas and they see a basket... I don't believe, it doesn't apart. open that way. It opens now, at least the way that it opens now is it tips back and then opens. So no, I don't, I wouldn't see that as something that this, the street sweepers of today are designed to accomplish. Okay. Um, how many, uh, you have 22 districts that you collect organics um, in, this, in the city. Is the, uh, what's the financial gain with regards to organics collection or, the, or is it an environmental issue? It's an environmental issue. It's an environmental issue. Um, so who, coll who collects the organics? Oh, sanitation workers are collecting. And where does it go? Um, it depends on where you are located. Yours, which I hope you are participating, uh, goes to the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant and is converted into natural gas. And who takes care of that? Is that a certain waste management? Well, it goes to waste management where we remove the uh, contaminants and then it goes to DEP. And who has the oversight to make sure that that's where it goes? What you mean that, that it goes, that organics goes, it's, it's recycled? So we have uh, export supervisors who are responsible for the contracts and who, make sure, who are responsible and make sure that we're, they're doing the right thing and that we're getting charged appropriately for uh, all of our material. So, so they do not work for, for sanitation? Waste management does not work for sanitation. Waste management. Um, so can, can yeah, I, I have one more question. Just to allow for other council members to I ask just got, questions. I just got one more question to finish the organic okay. session. That's right, it. Go ahead. Um, so what happens if the organics gets contaminated at the site? Does what happens to that? So I mean, we they the all of our vendors are required, and we actually own for our site on Staten Island pieces of equipment to remove contamination. So everyone is not perfect, particularly our school children, um, and so. <laughs> Unfortunately, so they have uh, they have mechanical equipment that removes the plastics out of the um, the organics, and so they they were permitted to choose their technology. Um, so we have the Tiger, um, American Recycling has the Scotts Turbo, and I believe Waste Management has the Core System, uh, and it more or less is like an auger centrifuge, and the and the thing pieces of it that are not uh, that are contaminants are pushed out and then the other material is sent either to um, compost facilities or in this case in Brooklyn to uh, the Newtown Creek Waste. Do they area. report to you how much, uh, how much organics gets contaminated? They, they have provided some reports, so I'd have to get back to you. I don't have that information right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Dorsch. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera? Uh, Mr. Chair, I had no question. He took all my questions. Uh, not just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I got very excited. <laughs> we can go short. I'm fine. <laughs> so uh, uh, first, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I want to thank you uh, for uh, the projections uh, that you made regarding zero, zero waste. That was very insightful and concerning at the same time. Uh, and to answer your question that you asked us earlier, no, I haven't received in my district any type of information regarding zero waste is not being permeated in my district 
at least I haven't felt it. Um, and Commissioner, uh, welcome. And um, first I wanna start with a point of clarification, and, and I know you know this, but just for, for the public at large, that uh, when we talked about the plastic bag, that we, we did everything possible here. It's now at the state level, and I know you know that. I know and I know so, that I was disappointed. I don't know, it's frustrating, uh, but hopefully uh, we'll get there. I wanted to ask you first about the, the, the sanitation truck fleet, and I'm asking because I really don't know. What type of fuel do we use for our trucks? What fuel do we use? Um, so our trucks are diesel, and then we have a small portion that are CNG. And so do we have technology that will run as the same as, as the MTA buses? You mean like electric? Uh, so they use, they use natural gas, right? So you, okay. there are natural gas trucks. We cannot uh, have a large fleet because the fueling is takes a long time. And since when we are in snow operations, I have about an hour to refuel the entire fleet and get them back out. I just don't have the ability to do that with the CNG fleet at this point. Um, it's challenging. They're, the fueling facilities are large which anyone who have any space for me, I will take it. Um, but we are also looking at other technology. Uh, Mac is, says they think they're gonna have uh, an electric, a full electric at the end of this year, we will see. Uh, so far they've not been terribly successful in any of the other vendors, but they know there's a lot of pressure uh, in the market to get a fully EV truck, so we, we will see. Can they make them hybrid? So when you do need the diesel, they could go into diesel? So we use a lot of different things. So we, we have some different technologies than a regular hybrid, as you think of in the car, we, is, which is sort of like power on demand so that it, when it goes into idle, it goes off. Um, Stop-start technology, which is very similar. Mm, um, hydraulic hybrids uh, in the mechanical broom. So we are using some other technology that we do think uh, has uh, some real value. Um, and has been reducing our, our diesel consumption. Um, the only thing I would also add is that, you know, as required by local law, uh, sanitation is compliant with all of the um, clean air requirements, and so we are 90% cleaner than we were 10 years ago, um, or a little more than 10 years ago at this point in time, and we continue to get cleaner, but if you talk to the big manufacturers, they, they really are feeling like it's going to be less about after treatment at this point in time, and it's really going to be more about which fuels do you choose um, and also how to get the most efficient engines, like how to get the most miles per gallon and, and sort of bend the curve that way as well. Have you spoken to Tesla? I know they have a truck. I know, but they, have, they don't have a collection truck. They but have can, a long-haul truck. Can they uh, be well, they're, incentivized they're, to, uh, they'll, to they'll create come. One? They'll be there. I think actually the the Max, the auto car, the crane carrier folks of the world are going to go probably first. There's actually a very large manufacturer in China, and I believe that LA has gotten a couple of their trucks medium in terms of uh, how effective they've been. The one, not, not on the record, uh, comment that I got was they're not so great on going up hills. Um, okay. We need our trucks to go up and down hills and be able to to uh, carry very large weights. But you know we're we're getting there. We're probably getting there faster than uh, one would think. So the Tesla truck, uh, what I've been told, is actually stronger than a Mack truck. You could take a Tesla truck, go up the hill against a, a diesel truck going down the hill and the Tesla truck will, will, right. will the, win that battle. The so. Tesla is, 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 is a long, with the only model they have so far is a long haul. I they see. don't have uh, a refuse truck to my knowledge yet, and no, their long haul truck is fascinating. Their long haul truck and what, they've, what they're doing there um, is amazing. I would hope that they get excited about the refuse truck market, and you know, I would love to have more competition in that market. So uh, happy to see that you'll, you'll be helping me pursue those goals. Okay, I'm gonna close with this last question. I wanna respect uh, the time here. Uh, so many good questions here, but in the first four months of fiscal 2018, the percentage of letters uh, responded 
to within 14 days was 44%, which is 17%, which is a 17% drop from the same time period in the prior year. What factors uh, do you see uh, you could accrue to the decline in respond rates? Additionally, the percentage of emails responded to in within 14 days was 68%, which is a 4% decrease from the same time period in the prior years. Uh, can you uh, address uh, the root of this root of the problem? Certainly. So, you know, obviously we try and be as responsive as possible and are looking closely to make sure that we can get those numbers up. Um, but some things do require us to go and do investigations. Often what, and, and I do, if it's actually sent to me, I do actually read it all. So, well. um, and many of them are uh, often from electeds who say the constituent says that this house on this block, that there's litter or something else. So we have to send people out to go and investigate and then send it back to do the write-up. And sometimes that does take us more than 14 days. Okay. And Commissioner, thank you. Uh, this year on the snow removal in my district was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited about a Tesla garbage truck. I'm, they haven't done that one yet. They have a really exciting long haul truck. But I think I think we just got something going and 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 you call, percolating. You call Musk and Maybe he, they're like garbage truck him, in New York City. That's well, a lot he's of money. Very interested in space right now, so you're going to have to shift his focus. Uh, space so. or garbage trucks for the city of New York? I don't know which I would choose. I admit, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call on Councilmember uh, Paul Valone, followed by Councilmember Aspera, and then Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, Chair. And also, since I was not at the first hearing with my kids at the doctor, congratulations on your chair of this committee. And uh, Commissioner, it was a pleasure to be with you. And I echo the council members. Uh, with a challenging winter, you've done, as always, an amazing job. And thank you for working with our community boards and our civic groups. When they ha make a call, you'll do your best to get there. And uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, with the going online of the waste transfer stations, and since mm -hmm. we had one of the first to come online in College Point, if not the first, how has the transition been? How have you seen the flow of the truck traffic and the regulation of the, the garbage itself? Can you just give us an update from your perspective? Certainly. I mean, uh, you know, there are many things that we have learned at North Shore um, that we are doing a little bit differently in other places. Uh, but we have seen, you know, you've seen a reduction in truck traffic into sort of Queens 12 or other areas where much of that waste is. I think our biggest challenge with North Shore right now is the Van Wick, um, is getting all the districts there in a timely fashion uh, up the Van Wick. So I'm actually thinking, who knew this would be a constraint for me, but that's my biggest issue right at the moment. Um, but it's going very well. We're moving a lot of material, and I think that uh, an elected colleague of yours when I was out in a blizzard with them. Um, if you'd like to meet me in a blizzard, this is something that I do. Uh, I've met with the chair in the blizzard conditions. Um, well, there's one every week now, so I'm sure we can figure that out. Uh, is, uh, he asked me, when are you gonna open that transfer station? I was like, it's been open for a year. And I was like, so I think that's what says like what the impact is uh, to that surrounding community. And I don't think anyone noticed when Hamilton opened. Um, I think they're being very effective at, they're really high tech facilities. Um, so well, you they know, are actually Let me, let me work neighbors. with you on, on that because w within the time constraints, I, maybe we can coordinate with the opening of the facilities. There's often capital infrastructure repairs in the surrounding area that need to be done. Um, working with DOT, working with the street maintenance, and it, uh, probably the majority of the local concerns is the, besides the truck traffic, is the wear and tear on the streets, mm -hmm. and how, and there, there are pre-existing conditions when these stations open that, that sometimes are exacerbated by the amount of the trucks. I think we should have better coordination with DOT and OMB on the capital plan of surrounding street infrastructure, the wear and tear, so that they can prepare for the brace of the extra trucks coming, and with the Van Wick's a perfect example. You have the Willis Point project coming. There's been talk about an extra off-ramp in that area. So your expertise on that topic, what may be the difference on whether the off-ramp is built or not. But I think there should be maybe some coordination with what you see mm -hmm. of the truck track, the, the street conditions that are there, and then the actual repairs of the streets that are happening at that time. Does yeah, that no, exist? I, I absolutely, I mean, I can, I can certainly talk to DOT, and, and we obviously have eyes on practically every street in the city of New York every day, um, but the one surrounding and whether or not, they, I mean, clearly as you get towards 
uh, North Shore, there are some blocks right there that could definitely use a little work. Um, <laughs> no, those, those are ramps. Those aren't even streets anymore. I think if you, uh, if you look around there between the police academy and all that. Yeah, I, there's, I, there's some, there, there's some interesting it, it's a little bit um, not smooth. Uh, so well, we'd love to work with you on making those priorities. I yep. think that that's where I think the communities would would work. Uh, their voices would be heard a little bit better if, if the combination of city agencies see the same thing. Then that should raise the priority of some of the street repairs. Okay. That which would help. Um, th the last thing I wanted to ask is, th the chair has here a whole bunch of facts which are which are wonderful. One of them that's was eye opening to see was the vacant lot cleaning requests and. Just in the first four months, we went from 53 to almost 1,500. And I know when we get calls in the council members' districts, sometimes the hardest part is finding out who's in control of that lot and whose responsibility is to clean the lot. And then by the time we get to actually who's the agency has to clean the lot and then who's not fighting with who to clean the lot, we have an unhappy constituent. So what's our plan with the increase on the vacant lots and what can we do going forward? Um, so there are, there are couple of, I think, categories in what your question is, and, and obviously we can always coordinate more. Any agency that owns property is responsible for their own property. Um, if it is a question of a... That's easier said than done, because sometimes which is, we which, <laughs> which goes back to, I know that you've been around long enough to know the Leventhal memo, um, and there's some who are more responsible owners than others. Uh, and, you know, we certainly can work harder at making sure that we understand what it is. Uh, for lots that have been identified as city owned that are end up falling under our purview, we take care of them pretty quickly. I actually find, and I mean, we do need to work better at making sure we coordinate with other agencies. Uh, our biggest challenge is actually private lots uh, where we can't get access. Uh, that is, and we have to get court orders. That is actually the longest duration time frame for me. Is there something we can do as a council to help expedite that process, whether I, it's through stream, streamlining the process? It's the not, it's, it's, inspectors not, it's it? not necessarily, it's not streamlined. It's sometimes the judges just won't give us access. Like sometimes even when the, because we go, the health department does it for us and says it's a public health issue. And sometimes the judges still say no. So can you explain that? So could yeah. you just go further in that so that folks could understand? We, the Department of Sanitation can't just cut down a fence and go into a vacant lot. They need an authority, for, they need authority from a judge to be able to do that. Um, so, well, I guess I well, You can do it, you can go Is ahead. there any <laughs> exception? Is there any exceptions to that? Like an that, emergency situation? No, or? there actually, there's not an exception because it, it, the, the reason we're going on and are in front of a judge is the health department has determined as the, an expert that it is a public health situation. Uh, and the judge can still find against you. Well, I think there, there you go. The chair can help you with that. We can put in some, if, if you, if we reach to an emergency situation at a lot, and I think the public health situation, we should be able to have a temporary sh um, situation to get in there that eventually is reviewed by the judge. But I don't think too many people would be complaining if you were responding to an emergency situation. I, I, I think that you are correct on 90% of the population. <laughs> that, I'll take those statistics, 90 Thank you, chair. We'll, we'll look into that as well, because um, I think it's an interesting case. I actually tried to clean out a private lot in my district. It took like six months to make that happen. Um, it, this, it's state court, um, so we might uh, be preempted from being able to do that, but it, well, our legal counsel will look into it. Um, and if there's any way that we can give the authority to the Department of Sanitation to walk in and clean a vacant lot much quicker, we'll definitely be taking advantage of that. So thank you for those line of questioning, that, that line of questioning. Councilmember Malone, I'll call on Councilmember Aspinall now. Thank you, Mr. Ch Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure being part of the committee. Um, and uh, hello, Commissioner. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you for all the work you're doing around organics pickup. Uh, I represent East New York. We're, we're still not there yet, but I'm, I'm sure coming. it's happening very soon. So I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, and, and along those lines of waste and reducing waste, uh, one, of the, one of the major um, concerns I have is around textile waste. And we know the fashion industry uh, produces a lot of textiles and hundreds of thousands of tons of, of, of textiles go into our landfills every year. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I correct? It's 6% a day. 6% six per, six a day? 6% a day. How, so how much 600 that, tons a day. Wow. How much does that cost at the SNY? Uh, times $140 a ton. I can't do uh, the math yeah. in my head. <laughs> so so is, is there a cost benefit in, in, in looking for ways to reduce the amount of textiles that go into our landfills here in New York City? Well, there's both a, a cost benefit and there's also an environmental benefit because the two worst parts of the stream in terms of greenhouse gases is organic food type material and then organic clothing. So cotton, wool, 
all things that de can decompose, um, or things made of polyester. But uh, so yes, we think that this is actually really important, and not to push on the ban, but. I find both the refashion program for apartment buildings as well as the e-cycle program for apartment buildings mm -hmm. equally convenient for people. But the uptake on the e-cycle for apartment buildings is far greater, and the reason for that is that you, we don't pick it up. Right. You know, we, right. You know, we under state law can't pick it up. So there is the case to be made that should the city of New York really be picking up textiles in with refuse? Uh, so I just put that out there. That's not something I'm asking for right now. I'm not asking for banning that. But um, but I think that textiles are, are sort of another frontier. I do think that we have a solid way forward on like the organics piece. And we have some really good programs on the textile side. Um, and we have done a lot of or tried to be hip and do outreach with fashion designers. We had a fashion show mm. um, <laughs> with reused clothing. Uh, but which made vote, by the way, made vote. Right, right. Um, but you know, this is something where we're still not getting enough. Even with the Goodwills and the Salvation Armies and our program and Housing Works, we still end up with a tremendous amount of waste so, going so to landfills. The, the current programs you have in place, what do you do with the textiles that you receive? So either we, we partner either with Housing Works primarily or with Goodwill. Okay, so they receive the clothing and they are able to distribute. They receive the clothing and they, I assume, resell them in to support their social mission. Right. Okay. Just something for me to think about. Yeah. No, it's really it's a me. it's a real challenging issue. Uh, textiles, particularly. I mean, I didn't grow up this way, but my children seem to go through a new wardrobe. Uh, fast fashion. Fast fashion. Yes. <laughs> very fast. Yeah. Very fast. Uh, so with my daughter away at school, I'm receiving quite a few fewer Amazon boxes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Aspinall didn't talk about a uh, piece of legislation that he's going to be pushing to, uh, to ban plastic straws. Oh. Rafael Aspinall, I'm sorry, Councilmember Aspinall. So I'm excited about that. Um, it's probably going to come through here. Uh, Councilmember Salamanca, and then we're going to go through um, a second round of questioning, which we will give uh, council members two minutes, and then we're going to actually see if we can get Bick in here early so that we can all leave earlier as well. So, Council Member Salamanca. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Hi, how are you? Um, I have questions in terms of enforcement. Um, I'm getting many complaints from my homeowners about the overzealousness of enforcement from your uh, enforcement officers. So I want to get straight to the questions. Does your uh, DSNY have a quota system? No. And so, you do not require your enforcement officers to give out a certain amount of summonses on a daily basis? No. Okay. Um, do you guys have an audit system where you audit the officers that are giving out violations to ensure that they're not giving out bogus uh, violations? So I'm not sure what you mean by an audit system. They have supervision that's supposed to go back and make sure that they are doing things appropriately. Um, I actually think that our summons activity is down this fiscal year. The instructions that I give to every new class is this is a tool that we want people to do the right thing, but I would rather have you walk down a street and see nothing wrong um, than have to write a ticket. All right. So there, by meaning, how often does a supervisor follow an enforcement officer to ensure that he's not just given a ticket to give a ticket, and in reality, that particular homeowner that not really clean their sidewalk? Um, in all honesty, their, their supervisor should see them every day. All right. Um, and, and is there, do you have a reporting mechanism to monitor how many violations each enforcement officer, agent? Right, yes. And so is that available? If so, how, how can we get access I think, to I mean, that? I think it's on a spreadsheet. I can have it sent to you. All right. So, you know, one of my you know, main reasons for bringing up these questions is um, I've, I've had certain homeowners come to my office with getting certain violations in terms of not cleaning up uh, between the hours of um, 8 two, and 9. Yeah, it's, it's 8 and 9 and then uh, I think 6 and And it seven. just seems that these different homeowners, the language that's written on their violation is exactly the same language. Well, they're taught to use the same language. Yeah, so therefore... They're writing observed bottles, wrappers, and papers scattered throughout within the 18 inches. 
But if there's no bottles and then there's just papers, why are they writing bottles? Well, they should be writing what they say. Yeah. And so I really would like to see more an investigation from your agency in terms are of they, Are you talking about handwritten tickets? Handwritten tickets. They're not being written by enforcement agents. They're being written by supervisors. They're not actually being written by enforcement so agents. Who's, who's enforcement supervising agents the supervisors? Uh, the superintendent supervises the supervisors. I would really like to have a side conversation with you on this. I feel that tickets with the same language are giving to different homeowners, and they're not being very specific. And so homeowners have two options. Take a day off of work and go fight the summons, or pay that $100 ticket, and then a few months later, you get another ticket, and it just goes up and up and up. Um, does sanitation do enforcement? So one of the dirtiest sidewalks that I feel that I have in my district are NYCHA and schools. Mm -hmm. Does sanitation enforcement do enforcement on NYCHA and school sidewalks? No. Why not? Because I can't write the ticket to those properties. All right. Is that something that we as a legislator, as a body, can, can help and, and, and enforce? Um, because I see here that you have what's called your performance indicators, and you know, you're at 94% of clean streets. When you're going out there and you're doing these performance indicators, does that include NYCHA sidewalks in schools? Well, let me be very clear on the scorecard. I don't actually do the scorecard. So the scorecard is conducted by the Mayor's Office of Operations. I don't know where they go. They won't tell me where they go. I guess where they go. Um, and spend probably way too much time in my brain trying to figure out where the scorecard raters are. Um, but they have a manual about how they rate streets. I don't actually know whether or not they include NYCHA or schools. Um, so that is done outside. It's like getting a report card. I, don't, I can't control what the report card is. I just, you know, I just find it disturbing that the, you know, and you're doing exactly what you need to do. You're enforcing cleanliness on homeowners and businesses, but you're not enforcing cleanliness on the city of New York, and it's an issue. Um, the dirt, again, the dirtiest sidewalks that I have are schools and our NYCHA uh, developments, and they're just walking away with dirty sidewalks, and it, and it just doesn't look good. Um, and so maybe it's a conversation we could have where you can provide them with violations. It can be reported on. Maybe at the end of the year, the city can just you know, you know, say, all right, you'll start at a zero balance. But I think that that data would be important for us to see which schools and in which districts uh, have the dirtiest sidewalks in terms of city-owned property. OK. Thank you. Uh, just to, to follow up with those that line of questioning, so there's no real, so you don't track the cleanliness of those sites either, right? So do you track them? Um, do you know what, what is the dirtiest, the dirtiest NYCHA development, for example, in the city of New York? Do you know what it is? Uh, so I don't track things beyond what the mayor's office of operations does in terms of sidewalk cleanliness. And as I said, I don't know whether or not they exclude them. I've never heard that they excluded them, so I don't honestly know uh, okay. that. Because I never thought I was getting a pass for their sidewalks. I thought that I was still getting held accountable for them. Um, okay. And then, you know, on schools, we, we don't tend to look at sidewalk cleaning. We, can some, we sometimes look at other uh, aspects of their uh, waste management. So I don't, I don't think we necessarily want a school to have to pay a fine. I think what we want to do is track how clean they are, because then we're talking about an operations or a management issue. Um, it could be that one, um, one night of development has great groundskeepers and they do their job, and that another one, maybe they're not doing their job. And we would love to know that so that we can hold them accountable. The same thing applies in schools. Uh, our schools being, our, our school, you know, uh, are keeping their sidewalks clean in one district and not in another. And then again, we could hold them accountable. But if everyone is just doing whatever they want and there's no tracking of it, um, it you know, it, it, it ends up being an image of the New York, of New York City that we're dirty around NYCHA and, and, um, and schools that I don't think we want, that, that perception. Um, so I, I will have, a, I would love to be a part of that discussion to see how we can track mm -hmm. and, and record uh, cleanliness in areas that you might not be able to summons. Certainly, I mean, I, I, we, could, we could certainly help and work with you on that particular goal. I'm happy to do so. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and now we have a, just a, uh, two more council member questions. Um, we wanna go with council member Cabrera, then followed by council member Deutsch. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for a second round. Uh, Commissioner, real quick, uh, 
right now we are the waste export goes to Alabama and where else? Oh no 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 we don't we don't go to Alabama. Oh we don't go to Alabama. We go to I South Carolina. In the papers we go to South something. Carolina, but not Alabama. So, so which one is the the state that they're complaining that the odors are coming out? It was in the papers the other day. Oh uh, okay. I think that it's a different agency. Um, Apparently, that's the sludge export contract, which okay, I am not responsible gotcha, for. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, but we have, I mean, we go to Virginia, South Carolina, uh, upstate New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. That's where our, my waste is going. Are those states eager to receive our trash because of the amount of, you know, extra... Money? Money, bottom line, uh, funding. Some. Some. Okay. <laughs> some. No, no, my fear is that maybe later on down the road, states will say, hey, you know, we really don't want this garbage in our states. Our constituents are complaining. And therefore, what, what would happen at that point? Uh, so we work very hard to be good neighbors and work very hard to work with people who don't... Um, uh, cause those sorts of issues. They can happen, and they have happened. Um, it's actually, and so we, we have long-term contracts, though, and the, the vendors would be required to find alternative disposal sites. Okay, and the other thing, because I only have 26 seconds here, is do we lose uh, the link uh, stations that we have uh, through our neighborhoods where we have internet and, you know, they have. Yeah. The, do we use that to uh, disseminate any kind of information um, uh, so for sanitation? I don't think that we've ever used Link. Uh, I think we've mainly gotten bus shelters for free. I think Link we are talking to about getting some of their space for free. I think that would um, be a great idea if we could do that. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I pay attention to it. I look at the weather for the day and so forth. You know, it's, it's, it, it just captivates uh, people's attention. And, and it's widely used in my district. I run out of time. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, but, I, but I'll follow up on the, if states don't want our trash, other states charge us more. So, for example, and I'll just make it up, you know, if New Jersey finds out that Pennsylvania cut a contract with the city of New York, they say, we'll take it, but for twice the amount. And then the waste export cost that we're paying right now, which is half a billion dollars, is going to continue to increase, which is why zero waste is extremely important and why we should all be supporting a zoning system as well. So we'll have that conversation when the time comes, but that's a great question that I will follow up on in that hearing, yes. is that if we lose a place to tr throw the trash out, we can't throw it in space. Maybe Tesla can help us um, throw it to, to <laughs> in space. I don't, think, I don't think that our goal should be to go to space. I think that we're going to try and make it so that we can create a closed loop economy where we are yes. not so wasteful. Yes, I agree. Um, and it'll be very expensive to send it to the sun. Um, so I think we're going to go with <laughs> Council Member Deutsch. Thank you. Um, so my, my question is, is uh, how much would it cost uh, to fully fund sanitation for seven days a week to pick up corner, tra uh, corner waste baskets as well as picking up uh, residential trash after a holiday or snowstorm? <coughs> I don't think I have the number for picking up seven days a week for all litter baskets with me today, um, but that is something we can certainly calculate. Uh, in terms, of, the number is big. This is going to be like this is a shocking number because you're asking me to surge staff for 12 days a year, and so that means I need 2,436 people, which will cost me when they get to full salary when they're five years in, 200 and. Six million dollars, which is why we don't chase. Okay. Well, this is um, we. This is a budget meeting, so we'd like to know the numbers. So this That's way we could discuss that. Okay. okay. That's the number. Um, okay. And for the corner waste baskets, you don't have that. Figure. I don't have that. I didn't know that you were looking for. Well, yeah, if you could, yeah, yeah. If you don't want to check that that's, out. That's relatively easy for us to calculate. Yeah, the seven days a week. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, on another note, I just want to ask you, you mentioned that you have a 40 member on advisory boards, 40 it's members. at least 40. Yeah, so what, is the, what does the advisory board do and also who appoints these members? So more or less we've let anyone who wanted to join, join. Uh, and we reached out to a lot of people and asked them to participate. For example, Rebney, Boma, uh, a bunch of the bids, uh, anyone we could think of who wanted to be a part of it. And so basically, uh, 
the consultants have been meeting with both larger groups and smaller groups to find out what's important to them. Um, what is really what, what would be the most important thing to you? How do you do it now? Um, you know, for some large buildings, like do you have liability things in your contracts that we would need to replicate in this? Uh, so they provide us with a lot of information about what's important to their constituents um, and you know what is uh, important to how we could make this successful. I mean, the goal is to ensure that should we get to an implementation plan, um, it's going to mean that everybody gives a little bit, I think, uh, but that it is something that will succeed. We cannot afford to design a system that does not, at the end of the day, make sure that commercial waste is effectively a move from the city streets. Thank you. Who um, appoints the board members? We don't really appoint them. I mean, like, how we do, reached out does, and asked people to participate. How does one participate. sign up to become a board Just member? let me know. You can okay. be on the board. So there's nothing, I, I would love it's to. It's really like, you yes, know, if you're willing to come to and spend a morning with us, we'll take you. Um, All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. That's a, it's the only board that the mayor has that you don't need to be appointed to. You just show up. That's how much we care about. We want everyone to participate. Um, and it's actually, so just to be clear, this is a board that is doing research on waste zoning and whether or not that is uh, uh, something the that, commercial. This, that this city can do. We don't know. Um, we're supposed to figure that out through this board. Um, but with the information we have, um, we feel confident that that is the way to go. But you can join the board. I'm just and wondering have your who's making the decisions for all our uh, our districts. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you should definitely be a part of that. And, and Remember, there, there's no way that. that that happens without it going through. Right. Us. No. So it, it would be like we we will eventually, based on all of this input, we'll give it to the council. And the council will make the decision about whether or not they want to move forward. And we will have to do an environmental review and do that, all of that regular stuff that we'd have to do. So we're, we're a ways away from it. But no, nothing is going forward that if you don't want to be part of this, that you would not actually have at least a second, third, or fourth bite at the apple on later on. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think we're good. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you for your time. And again, uh, the work you've done with Snow and just general uh, sanitation work. I want to thank the, the men and women of sanitation and thank you um, for the work that you're doing. Um, and we'll follow up on a lot of these uh, concerns and questions that we have in the future and see you after the preliminary budget response by the City Council. And everyone should take their zero by 30 bags with them. Yes, we have bags. I've given out 250,000 of them. So if you yes. see them everywhere, someone actually, I think, uh, Instagrammed a picture of it in like Turkey or Malta or something, you know, something yes. crazy where I've never been. Yeah, well, we'll have them. Thank you so much. And I just want to, Councilmember Cabrera, letting us know that it was the state government that pulled the, the plastic no, bags. No, it from is true. Us. You did do the best that you could in terms of the bags, but we may be having to fight the fight again. I was, you know, if the governor does something, I'd be thrilled, but I don't know if that's going to happen in this budget. So, yeah, I hear you. Thank you again, Commissioner. Thank you. We're just going to take a two-minute recess, two minutes.
Okay. Yes. Ooh, this is nice. Okay, we're gonna begin in like uh, five seconds. Sergeant at Arms, um, are you almost ready? Oh, you're ready to go, okay. So we're back for uh, the round two uh, and getting, uh, receiving testimony from Commissioner Brownell of the New York City Business Integrity Commission. Um, so welcome, and we're going to we're going to swear you in uh, before we begin, um, and then we'll and then we'll move forward for your testimony. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to answer council member questions honestly? Thank you. Okay, you guys usually ask other people to do that. Um, <laughs> You don't, you don't. Well, um, you may begin, Commissioner. Thank you. And Brownell, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Business Integrity Commission, or BIC. Joining me today are Deputy Commissioner of Legal Affairs and General Counsel Noah Janelle, and Assistant Commissioner of Finance and Administration Cindy Haskins. Seated just behind um, us are Bix, is BIC's Director of Policy, Salvador Arona. Thank you for inviting us here to testify. <clears throat> for council members new to this committee, I'll start by giving you some background information about BIC. Because we are a small agency with a relatively narrow focus, people are often not familiar with us. We are both a law enforcement and a regulatory agency, currently with a total of 83 employees and one higher in process. Of that total headcount, 10 are investigators, many of whom are retired NYPD detectives. We also have a squad of detectives from the NYPD's Criminal Enterprise Investigations Unit who work on criminal investigations. BIC was originally formed as the Trade Waste Commission, created more than 20 years ago to oversee the commercial garbage hauling or trade waste industry, which has been corrupted which had been corrupted and controlled by organized crime for decades. Soon after, the City Council added oversight of the public wholesale food markets to our duties and our name changed to the Business Integrity Commission. We play a unique role in city government as we work to regulate and improve these once troubled industries. In fact, there is no other agency like BIC anywhere in the country. The main component of BIC's oversight is our comprehensive background check process consisting of thorough investigations into the owners, key employees, and financial structures of our applicants. We seek to ensure that those companies are not operated by or financially connected to organized crime or other corrupt influences. After over two decades of BIC regulation, these industries are now far better than they were. As a result, we have been able to evolve beyond our traditional role of eliminating corruption to address new challenges in the industries we oversee. Collecting and hauling trade waste, particularly in New York City, is a dangerous and difficult job. The collection trucks are big and heavy, and there are many other vehicles, along with cyclists and pedestrians, rushing to get around in a limited amount of space. That is why this administration has made safety in the industry and on the streets a priority. Since being appointed commissioner four years ago, I established a monthly trade waste advisory board meeting with members of management of several companies and other industry representatives 
to discuss important issues relevant to trade waste and BICS oversight. We have also increased our discussions with other industry stakeholders, such as advocates, communication is key to effective regulation. In 2016, we joined the city's Vision Zero Task Force to help eliminate traffic-related deaths in the city. This group is made up of some of the best and brightest from New York City agencies like DOT, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, the NYPD, TLC, the MTA, and others. Our membership on the task force has greatly enhanced our ability to gather key safety-related data that we never had in the past. As part of our work on the task force, we are establishing a panel to review serious crashes involving trade waste vehicles. The panel will consist of members of agencies on the, trade, uh, the Zero, Vision Zero task force and will allow us to analyze past crashes in an effort to prevent them in the future. We expect this panel to begin work in the near future. Recently, we have focused on how to ensure that all trade waste companies operating in the city have written and, com have written and comprehensive safety protocols. On February 20th of this year, the Commercial Waste Zone Collection Safety Group, headed by BIC and the New York Department of Sanitation, released a trade waste safety manual. We have provided all of you with a copy as part of today's testimony. The manual is a culmination of 15 months of group work generated by Carter's safety and environmental advocates and organized labor, specifically locals 813 and 108. It is now available on BIC's website, which is, located, which is stated in the testimony. The next step for the safety group is to produce videos that expand on key topics in the manual, a project already well underway. The Vision Zero Task Force has been helping us with this process. All carters will be able to use the videos to educate their workers and managers. As an example, there will be a video that takes drivers through the pre-trip inspection of their trucks and other equipment, which they should be conducting at, at the start of every shift. The inspection includes the compilation of the daily driver vehicle inspection report, a sample of which is included in the manual. There are other safety-related concerns that the Commission is seeking to address. Perhaps most importantly, we want to address the problems of speeding and other traffic law violations by trade waste trucks. We have found th those problems to be rooted in larger management-related issues, such as overloading collection routes so that drivers and helpers have to rush to finish them in time. We intend to create additional rules and potential legislation to address tradeway safety concerns in the near future, and I hope to work with you, Chair Reynoso, and the rest of the committee on navigating these critical issues. As part of BIC's increased work in tradeway safety, we have increased our communications with trade waste workers, particularly drivers and helpers and organized labor. Teamsters Local 813 and the laborers and Laborers Union Local 108 have been particularly helpful in our efforts to reach out to workers. Our discussions have reinforced just how difficult the job of being a driver or a helper is. Of course, we knew that the physical work was backbreaking, but far worse is that drivers and helpers' hours are often too long, and as a general matter, the workers are not properly compensated. In some cases, the treatment of industry workers is flatly abusive. Poor conditions for drivers and helpers is not only unfair and unhealthy for them, but also results in dangerous conditions for everyone on the city's streets. I am committed to continuing to foster our relationship with organized labor and both union and non-union trade waste workers. Understanding their jobs and the challenges they face is an important component to making the industry safer as well as the city as a whole. Turning to other issues at BIC, we are continuing to decrease the time it takes to process both trade waste and public wholesale market applications. We have made additional pro process adjustments, such as prioritizing new applicants, allowing them to enter the marketplace without undue delay, and the resulting improvements are now evident. In the first four months of, the fiscal, of fiscal year 2018, compared to the same period of fiscal year 2017, BIC has reduced the average time to approve a waste hauling application by 45 percent, 
and a market application by 28 percent. Additionally, during the same periods, the average age of a pending trade waste hauling application declined by 42 percent and a market application by 25 percent. When I first appeared before you four years ago, these numbers were poor. I am happy to say that we have turned it around and will, be, and will continue to improve. In the process, we have also simplified our application and are now moving toward an online application and submission process. Chair, Re Chair Reynoso and members of the committee, when we are ready, I would like you uh, to come to BIC so that we can actually run through an online application so that we can show you the improvements. In the area of BIC enforcement, we are finding a significant decrease in unlicensed Carter activity in the city. We have issued 53 percent fewer of those violations compared to a year ago, which I attribute to higher compliance rates. Be assured that we have not decreased our attention to such violations. In fact, stopping companies from operating illegally is at the core of what we do. While the number of violations issued in the past year to market businesses has remained constant, I remind the Council that soon after I started at BIC, we focused more on resolving challenges and problems there rather than simply issuing violations. As a result, violations issued in the markets have been relatively low for the past three years. Along with the PMMR data, BIC is working on a number of projects to require data, that require data analysis. One such project involves enforcement of Local Law 145 of 2013, which requires all heavy-duty trade waste vehicles to comply with 2007 EPA standards for engine emissions by January 1st of 2020. To assist in these important data-driven projects, we have hired a data analyst to provide routine analytical data support to our various units. This role is crucial as we continue to modernize BIC and recognizes the essential role that data plays in our law enforcement and regulatory functions. Enforcement of the commercial recycling waste collection rules began in August, August 1st, 2017. Under those rules, it is illegal for private carters to mix putrescible waste with source-separated recyclable materials in the same truck compartment. BIC is committed to ensuring private carters comply with the law, and we have investigators actively pursuing violations of the commercial recycling rules. To date, BIC has issued 34 violations to 16 different companies. These violations come with hefty fines, which is reflective of the seriousness of the violations. Thus far, none of these violations have gone to a hearing, which reflects the strength of the evidence supporting the violations we're issuing. Our own investigators are working hard to catch these violations, but we also strongly encourage the public to help our efforts by submitting tips. To this end, BICT has updated the complaint section of our website to make it easier to submit complaints online. Users can now upload pictures and videos as part of our, their complaint. When the public sees a carter breaking the rules or creating unsafe conditions, if they can do so safely, they should take photographs or videos and provide them to us. They can remain anonymous, but if they give us their contact information, we will let them know what develops from their tip. I think that those who have given us tips already will agree that we do a good job in taking actions on the tips and updating those who provided them to us. I now want to touch on an industry that we do not regulate, but that is highly troubled and in need of oversight, the heating oil supply industry in New York City. Since November of 2015, when the Manhattan District Attorney announced the indictments of nine heating oil companies and 44 of their owners and drivers, nothing has been done to curb the fraud in this industry. Heating oil consumers throughout the city, including schools, religious institutions, hospitals, police precincts, and courthouses, to name a few, are losing tens of millions of dollars each year to theft. This has been going on for at least the last 30 years. As you know, there is a bill pending before the Council, now known as Intro 259, after being reintroduced from the last term, that would make BIC the regulator for the industry, much in the same way we regulate the trade waste industry. 
We hope to work with the Council to pass this important measure this term. In closing, I want to turn back to safety in the trade waste industry. While out early in the morning walking my dog, I have seen private garbage trucks operating in an unsafe manner. I am sure many of you have as well. There is no doubt that driving garbage trucks in the city is difficult and dangerous, but unsafe driving simply must stop, and management must stop overloading collection routes so that they are impossible to complete without rushing. Safety must become the number one priority where everyone in the company has a stake in the outcome. Thank you for your interest in the work that we do, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. And I kind of want to start where you ended in relation to safety. Um, at this moment, you have a, a headcount of 88 um, in, your, in your agency in the FY 2019 budget. Um, just want to go, uh, first, I know that while you're walking your dog, you're not flagging down a, um, a truck, but kind of want to get into that. What authority do you have in relation, let's say, to speeding trucks? Um, in my district, just to put in perspective, a truck recently killed a biker. Um, and uh, just want to know who has the authority to take on those type of cases? Well, the, the, the PD is the main one to have the authority, and one, of, and one of the advantages of being part of Vision Zero is the PD is a big player in that particular group. And so one of the things that we've done, as well as, as other agencies have done with other kinds of vehicles, is to inform um, the PD so that they can mobilize their people in areas where um, you, there, there seems to be a lot of speeding. So where I live in Upper Broadway, um, early in the morning, 5.30, 6 o'clock, there's not a lot of traffic. Um, Columbia University is right there, and so really nobody's out. And so I think the problem is that because drivers don't really see anybody, and the Broadway is a three-lane road, they drive, quite frankly, like their rear ends are on fire uh, far too often. And so that's the kind of thing that we really tip the PD off so that they can do more enforcement. Okay, so you wouldn't need necessarily an expansion of headcount to do the enforcement of, let's say, a speeding truck. No, as I said, that's uh, when you're working collectively with other agencies, and Vic does that in every facet of what we do, then you can really mobilize um, the sort of best um, practices of the other agencies that you work with. And clearly, traffic violations are, are the most, you know, really what the PD does. So now, you also talked about the fact that you recognize that some of these uh, routes and how many businesses are along those routes might be onerous and um, have these private waste uh, drivers feeling like they need to speed up. Um, what authority do you have there? We don't have any now. Um, one of, and I, I refer to, you know, in the last couple of months, really for the first time since I've been commissioner, um, working really through uh, the Teamsters and Local 108, we've been able to get access to some of the workers. We're only at the very start of this conversation with drivers and helpers. I have to say, in the two major meetings we had, um, it was pretty startling to hear directly from them what the conditions of their jobs are. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are definitely going to be focusing more on that because um, and again, I'm not saying this is true across the agency, uh, excuse me, across the industry, but you know, given what we've done so far, it is far too common um, that the conditions are ridiculous, including you know, drivers and helpers given routes that are just way overloaded with stops. Okay, so, so you did mention yet that you don't enforce it yet or don't have the authority to but enforce it. But we would it need, yet. so we would, and, and Noah can really do this more accurately, although I'm happy to to start out, um, we really need an expansion of our legislation to make it clear that we have the authority to oversee um, and to promulgate rules related directly to safety in the industry. As you know, the Trade Waste Commission, which is kind of where this agency started, was really based on rooting out and keeping out corruption. So, um, as, and we've been working with the law department who are our legal advisors, and so, you know, we're gonna be coming with you to you and the rest of the committee to talk about, um, which I think would be a rather simple expansion of our legislation to make it clear that we have the authority to promulgate, the commission has the authority to promulgate safety-related uh, rules. So to put it in perspective, right now, 
there's no real way to record or track exactly how many hours a driver is in a truck, for example. It's not easy. I mean, and certainly probably one of the, you know, some of the rules that we're going to be promulgating are going to be requiring companies to keep better records, and one of them would certainly be the hours of drivers and helpers. So that's, that's important to note, just, um, you know, there are issues in the private industry that we have limited information about, and it makes it very hard to enforce. Well, that's you, certainly one of them. Yeah, giving you some authority on those issues right. can really start helping us uh, bring, them, bring them in. Um, so the, the other one is, um, I, I want to get to just the, the, PMR, the PMR. Uh, in it, you have uh, indicators regarding your targets, for example, uh, big performance indicators, average time to approve waste hauling applications in days, news and, new and renewal. Your targets you just write down. Um, is there a reason why um, you don't feel comfortable putting a number um, th that speaks to progress uh, there? Yeah. Council Member Reynoso, Noah Janelle, um, Deputy Commissioner of Legal Affairs. So. That indicator pointing down has been there since I've been there. We are certainly, um, and we have been, I think, doing a much better job since the commissioner has taken over in um, getting through applications in a timely manner. And we're certainly open to discussing a more uh, definite target in that area. I'm trying to introduce the new BIC to the city council and the new big is gonna give us numbers. They're not just gonna write to bring it down, they're gonna let us know exactly what they think they can do. Now I have faith that you can achieve those goals, but I really wanna make sure that they're, they're, we're holding you accountable to giving us numbers and not just writing down. Because I don't know if uh, going down you know, one is progress, but in this, it would be. Uh, so I just wanna make sure that we get there. And I feel confident that you can do that. I just wanna make sure that I outline it here. Um, the next thing is the, the trade waste safety manual. This is great. So a lot of us have been fighting for these types of things, and uh, this is, is this a mandatory manual that every single private carding company has that they have to give to their drivers and to whoever's working on their trucks? Is this a mandatory manual? Not yet. It is not, not yet. So this so is not mandatory. What it would take to do that would be a rule by the commission, and again, as you know, the commission isn't just BIC, it's Sanitation, Department of Consumer Affairs, the PD, DOI, and Small Business Services, but a rule that would, and, and we're working on it, but it would say something along the lines that we're gonna require every trade waste company um, to use the manual and to come up with their own written safety protocols, which are comprehensive, meaning they're covering every major aspect of what a company should have rules for regarding safety in their company, provide it to us. Um, again, we're a small agency. We can't go through it word by word, but we can certainly review it um, to see whether or not um, it appears to be a comprehensive effort by that company to come up with written protocols. Okay. So, you know, I, I want to allow for my colleague to ask some questions, so there's going to be, I'm just going to follow up on that. Um, it's concerning that considering uh, what we've seen recently in relation to crashes and deaths um, and also worker safety, um, that there isn't a universal manual that the city pr produces to give to these, uh, to these businesses as a, as a foundation, as a basis of safety. Um, and and um, I think there's a, a, an opportunity in the evolution of BIC, how I call them, the new BIC, right. um, that you know, corruption, for example, um, corruption could just be that you're not giving your guys hard hats and, and, and uh, gloves or, or, or teaching them the appropriate way, way, way to inspect their trucks before they go out. I think that's an issue that we, we have to look at. And if we don't have necessarily an agency being able to, that can do that now, then I would love to expand the authority of BIC to be able to do that type of work. And that we talk about, again, the evolution of BIC and their authority outside of just you know uh, corruption. Um, and, and I definitely see mandating this to be in everyone's, you know, in everyone's training manual, uh, training um, as, as something that's positive. And then I think you talked about a video as well. Right. When I worked, I worked in Pier 1 Imports. 
They made me sit down through a three hour video mm -hmm. about how to move things around. Yep. These guys are driving dangerous trucks every single day and they don't have something that's mandatory and that makes sense there. Now there are some people in the industry, some businesses in the industry that absolutely do have these type of, of videos and manuals. Um, but it's not universal. One company can have an eight point inspection system for your truck, the other one could have 20. We don't know. Right. Um, I think finding a, a baseline there could be very helpful. Right, so with regard to the manual, um, you know, obviously Department of Sanitation in a way is like a great big huge carding company. Um, and so they played a major role in, in the creation of that. But I also have to tell you that, that the carding companies themselves, especially some of the larger companies, well not just the larger companies, you know, provided significant contribution to all that, um, along with, orga with organized labor. Um, and so that's why um, th that manual is, is as good as it is. We're not the experts in safety. Right. You know, we beg, borrowed, and steal from the people that actually know what they're doing to put it together. Yeah, agreed. And I know they've been having safety symposiums recently. Right. That I think April 11th, you're all invited, Ebbets Field. Yeah. I have to be there, but um, I think ben that Field. that's... Oh, Floyd Bennett Field. Yeah, and, and I think that within the industry, they're trying to you know, streamline this and make it so that it's like a universal document that they right. can have. Well, I think it is. I think we made it, we made it general. It, it's obviously, um, you know, has a lot of detail to it and it's comprehensive, but we made it general enough so that I think basically every section of it complies in one way or another to every size company. Okay. So that's it. It's encouraging to see that. Now, um, speaking about speeding up these application processes which is i think the biggest complaint that we get you know oh, i got to wait a whole year before you know with a pending application or and so forth i think that you talked about a process by which we would put them online right. and that could help really streamline that process so i want to ask what progress have you made in regards to the online application process so where we are and actually alice and bonfoy who's sitting back there really led the effort um, and so we have the whole thing put together in terms of what the questions are. Now it's a matter of translating those questions, you know, through an IT process into an online program, which is something I know. To me, it's like voodoo or black magic. But that process has been going on for a few months, um, and hopefully it's going to be done um, by the end of the year. Okay, so the content is in... It's just about plugging the content. Right, and by in. the way, in coming, in coming up with the content, we're always looking to cut the questions that we ask because we know it's a pain in the neck for companies and individual you know principals to fill this out so we're constantly trying to look to ways to scale it back so that it's not um, it isn't so annoying enforcement about like mixing the recycling with general refuse um, can we talk about the um, your progress you've made compared to last year um, to well, this that's year's? easy huh? that's me? easy it's 34 this year and none last year. So you've increased by yes. like an exponential amount. Well, last year, of course, that it wasn't. Last year, the rules hadn't gone into it. Well, the rules had gone into effect, but the enforcement right. period didn't start till August 1st of 17. Right, and, and now I think there was some concern regarding the relationship with, let's say, advocates and BIC in getting information in so you can enforce that. Um, have you seen an increase in, in, in it, cooperation? It, it, Yes, I mean, there has been, and again, th so if, if we, and right now, in fact, we had a meeting with our head of enforcement this morning, you know, if we don't have tips, whether it's what are the bad companies, bad in quotes, meaning that we think aren't recycling property or, or commingling illegally, or particular locations, then we're relegated to going out and following um, in an unmarked big car garbage trucks at night seeing what they're doing at each stop. That's not really a very efficient way to do this. When we have a tip, you know, that allows us to focus, then we can set up on a location which is much more productive and, you know, hopefully assuming that they are violating the rules, catch them in the act. And it isn't only for our investigators to see it, it's our ability to take photographs and videos that become the evidence we need at oath should they uh, challenge the violations. Okay. So, um so back to the budget portion of it, the reason I asked that question is, do you need more people? Do you feel that uh, if we increase your, your staff and your enforcement staff, that you will see an increase in the amount of folks you're, you're going after in relation to mixing? So this is the garbage. thing I would say about that. We have a very good relationship, at least since I've been at BIC with OMB. 
Um, you know, one of the big things we did this year, as I indicated in the testimony, is to bring on a data analyst, which is really important because we have data. And to a large extent, I mean, I don't know what to do with it. I mean, in how to comply, how to make it accessible. So, as I, so, you know, we'll work that out with OMB, and if there's a problem there, and I don't anticipate there will be, because as I said, for now almost four years, um, they've been really supportive. All right. So, so you feel that if there is a need for an increase in capacity, you have OMB. And if I'm not getting it, I will, I will let you know. Please do so, because I think that's a big issue that a lot of folks have, or some folks have, is um, I know that you're, you mentioned, like, for example, the heating oil industry and thinking that there's some corruption there, or actually uh, the indictments uh, that have recently come the make it so that. The convictions, the right? convictions but, now. But the concern we have is, is the enforcement happening in, in the avenues where the authority already exists for BIC? And why expand their authority to, to another, to another uh, a group or industry um, when we're falling short on, on this one. So I just want to make sure that you feel that you have the authority and the manpower to handle the enforcement of recycling, um, you know, and, and that that's shored up and that we, we've crossed our T's and dotted our I's before we move on to, to figuring out if we could expand Right, well, let me make a couple else. things clear. First of all, there is no way we're taking on heating oil or anything else unless we get more bodies to do that. Um, because then we're dropping the ball with the a industries that we already oversee. And actually, with regard to OMB again, um, we've actually had, I mean, not in the last several months because the bill's really been in the council, but we actually worked out with heating oil um, sort of all the new personnel we figured we'd need to do that. And it's really just waiting for the council to, to pass the bill. But my point is, um, and on something like recycling, I mean, it, it's never going to be handled. That's, it's ne you're never going to have a circumstance where everybody's abiding by the rules. And so there's always, there always need to be vigilance out there. But as I've said, you know, there's nothing, you know, it's like the PD with potential terrorist activity in the city. You know, we need everybody to, I mean, obviously, you know, violating the recycling rules isn't as bad or as dangerous as a potential terrorist incident. But the point is, we need the eyes and ears of the public, and especially those that are very much focused and interested on having these rules be abided by, to let us know when there are problems, because it helps us do our job better. So how, how have you promoted like the hotline or the tip line, I guess? Uh, it's, so you know, we, it's, every place we go, you know, where there's potential people, like we went to a community board meeting, I don't know, a month ago. So one of the things we talked about with them was, and of course, you know, it was in the east side, is when you see things, let us know. And we told them exactly how to do it. Can, uh, can I just uh, request that um, as part of your inf the information that you give to communities, that you go to North Brooklyn or Community Board 1, I'd uh, be happy South to do Bronx, that. I would be happy to um, do and that. And Southeast Queens. So I want you to go to three districts that have the most, the most waste transfer, uh, the most uh, transfer stations so that it just, it just would make sense because they would see the most folks coming in and out now. I know they're not the businesses where you would catch them because they're out and about in other parts of the city, but um, just that hotline being available to them I think would be, would be helpful because they're very um, astute to say the sure. least and, and right. are paying attention to this issue. Right, so what I'll do is I'll have our Sal get mm -hmm. a hold of, I guess, Asher from your yeah. office and set those things up. Yeah, that would, that would be great, I appreciate that. Um, I have, a, I think, maybe one or two more questions. The waste hauling applications pending, we see, we see that your target is 300. The four-month actual is 494, for example, or it's 400. Um, that seems like an, an increase and in that you're missing your target. Is it because the applications come in early on and that in the first four months you're seeing uh, the applications come in and that eventually they tail down? But I just want to know... Um, why the applications take so that long? Or, I mean, why are you not meeting your target at this moment? It's a two, uh, we have a two-year renewal cycle, right. and so um, our renewal applications are somewhat cyclical. So, and at this year, we have more pending than we did last year, so that is a reason that the number has gone up. Uh, but one thing that I do want to note, and I've, I've mentioned this before, is that Although we, are, we issue licenses and registrations, we're different than 
uh, an agency like the DMV where if you pass your road test and your written test, you get your license and it's kind of, you know, they, you go on your way. Um, it's more complicated in this industry and so we are never gonna have, for example, zero applications pending because there are always going to be legitimate reasons for it to take longer and um, so, and there are some applications that take much longer than others that do tend to skew our numbers. But I can tell you that I'm on top of this every single day and um, there are several other supervisors in the agency. I can tell you that there is nobody who is working towards these numbers that, oh, I've got 300 days, so I'm gonna put this off for 100 days. Everybody is working, frankly, very hard on each of these applications, but there are complications that come up. We also have to wait for documents to come in. We issue subpoenas, we take depositions. It takes a long time. So that, those are some of the contributing factors to, um, to the length of these applications. No, that, that's good to know. Maybe like an asterisk that lets us know that this is like a two year pending out, two year process and some one year is gonna be high, the other year is low, and that we're trying to just average them out. Um, it makes it a lot clearer because right now it doesn't look that it doesn't look that way. We don't know if you're just you know John Smith coming from outside just doesn't know that. So I just want to make sure that there's some clarity there. Um, so I had one more question that is that is eluding me, and I apologize. Um, Oh, well, that's it. If I forget, I can't have everyone waiting here while I remember. Um, but I do want to say, um, Commissioner, I think that I'm glad to see the, the 0 to 34 because of, you know, the, the fact that it was implemented last year and that we're going to see some, some changes. I think people really want to see that enforcement. Um, uh, I am a supporter of your authority, expanding your authority, both for increasing safety and the heating oil industry. I think it, it makes sense. Um, and really want to see that happen. I think it's uh, about the continual uh, evolution of BIC that I think I want to. I, I think I, I want people to move to. I know the members of my committee are not here right now, but when we do have those hearings, um, I want to continue to educate them on the work that you do and that you could do, so that we can so that we can see progress. But um, outside of that, I think we're good on our end. So I really appreciate your time that you've had here, and uh, see you soon. Right, and we'll see you in North Brooklyn. Yes, North Brooklyn, I'm gonna, my community board, they'll have a lot of questions. Well, I don't wanna hype it up too much because <laughs> then they don't ask you any questions. You're like, Antonio, this was nothing. So I, I wanna hold out. Uh, right. But again, thank you for your time, I appreciate it. And I just, I wanna thank the folks that have sat through both of these uh, uh, testimonies and questions by council members and by uh, the agency. Um, the folks we're probably we're going to hear from, I'm looking at these names, are like on the front lines of this type of work. Um, so we're going to set them all together because there is no pro or against because we all care about trash. So uh, Brendan Sexton, if you come up, Cecil Corbin, Mark, Phil Voss, Kendall Christensen, and Lewis Bailey. So you guys can all come in. Yeah, we'll get you some chairs, guys. Okay, this is good. So can do one. Can we get some, so yeah, we're gonna get some chairs for you right now. Oh, th there you go, we figured that out. So do we have Brendan, Cecil, Phil, Kendall, and Lewis? Thank you. So we only have three of those folks here. Okay, sorry. I was just seeing um, if anyone was missing. Um, we wanna, we wanna. <laughs> So um, 
there's going to be no clock. Uh, you know, you guys have waited all this time. We want to give you an opportunity to at least speak your mind and say Thank you. what you want. Um, as a former sanitation commissioner, we're actually going to give you the start. So we'll go from my right to, to left. So, uh, Mr. Sexton, please. Thank you. Please. I Absolutely. appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'd love to come down to City Hall and hear the word commissioner again. <laughs> Nobody calls me that at home. Uh, but thank you very much. I'm actually here today as a board member of Energy Vision. Phil Voss is here, who's of Energy Vision. He works there. And my issue is a singular one, which is to get diesel trucks out of our neighborhoods. Um, I hope you got copies of my testimony. It says simply that when I was commissioner in the 80s, I thought we did a great job, but I was shocked one day crossing this park on the way to City Hall to run into a demonstration of people who were protesting our trucks in the neighborhood. I never ever thought that we were polluters and I was horrified to find out about it. So I started looking into it and in fact, um, asthma, as you probably know, has a vague causality. No one's quite sure what caused it, but one of the only certified uh, evidential, evidentially supported causes or triggers of asthma are particulates from diesel emissions. So I was horrified as commissioner to think that we were cleaning the people's streets and filthying up their air at the same time. And you know our trucks don't just pass through, they idle outside people's bedroom windows, they idle outside the schools. I was horrified. Anyway, so what could we do? I asked the guys, very talented Department of Sanitation engineers and vehicle uh, folks are among the most talented and sophisticated in the world. And uh, they said, well, there's a possibility we could use natural gas in the trucks. It works almost the same as diesel. Let's find out about it. So we tried to buy some. We did buy some, actually. Uh, they were not good. They didn't work well, and they didn't have the torque to plow it, snow, et cetera. So we experimented, et cetera, and now the sanitation department and others have been working on diesel refuse trucks for long enough that at this point, they're almost the industry standard. More than 50% of new refuse trucks ordered in America today by, by private commercial haulers and municipalities are powered by natural gas. Um, sweepers also can be powered by natural gas. Not only are they cleaner, they're much quieter. And again, since we work right outside people's windows and we start early in the morning and work till late at night sometimes, that seemed like a really important consideration. Cleaner, quieter, and frankly, over most of the 10 years I've been looking at this, cheaper, the fuel has been cheaper. So um, the trucks cost a little more. They do, they're more expensive than diesel. Uh, but, but you save that over the life of the truck and diesel costs. So I have been um, more and more active over the last couple of years in trying to see if I can encourage the city of New York to switch to diesel fleet. And I've come be to the conclusion that there is no longer any excuse for the municipality a public sector organization to be buying heavy duty diesel engines to send into people's neighborhoods. There was a time when the technology wasn't there. There was a time before federal subsidies, especially when it seemed horribly expensive. Um, there was a time when they weren't available readily. That's no longer true. There are several manufacturers. The prices are comparable to diesel. A little more, natural gas costs a little more, the truck. Um, but they're available off the shelf now. You can buy trucks now, since you're not gonna replace the whole fleet in one purchase, but you could meet this city's and the private sector's purchase orders now with off the, tr the shelf technology that's available today. And given that, it would strike me that if I were still in the same position and public servant, I would not think it entirely responsible to be buying diesel trucks to send down the streets in our people's neighborhoods. And that's actually my only major point here. There are lots of questions about refueling and can you do it and how many vendors are there and we can get into that. But my main point is I believe as a policy matter, the government of the city of New York should not be in the business of buying and deploying heavy duty trucks, especially those that were mine once and are still out there, the ones that sit in front of residences, schools, and hospitals and idle while they work. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. And we are going to be looking into uh, seeing if maybe the Department of Sanitation or the administration is willing to look into um, a study of some sort that looks into our reliance on diesel trucks for, for um, 
for sanitation and see if we could, I think we're, and I don't want to get quoted on this, well, I will, so I want to say <laughs> that I might be incorrect, but I think the Department of Sanitation is actually the most, uh, has the most pollutant uh, vehicles, I guess, uh, uh, in the city of New York. I think we have the most, we cause the most pollution to vehicular traffic in the city of New York. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look into that, but if we're serious about, um, about addressing issues of, of, of our carbon footprint and, and being the city of the future, we, we have to look into it. Uh, I know we have obstacles. I know that we don't have a lot of locations where we can fill up uh, natural gas tanks, um, uh, the electric vehicles that um, the commissioner has done research on that I've talked to her about. She says don't, don't have the power to, to move trash the way she would want. So there's a lot of, a lot of issues, um, but I think we should look into to it a little Thank deeper. You. I could speak to a couple of those. It, it yeah. is true that you have to have more refueling stations in New York, but the major operators in the field, Clean Energy and Trillium, are anxious to do so. They're not only willing to, in fact, I think Clean Energy is opening a new refueling station in the Bronx this week, next month, something like that. They would like nothing more than to meet the city's needs, believe me. And the new trucks absolutely meet the torque and power requirements of the Department of Sanitation. Since I'm speaking, I'll also say that the department has been great in terms of experimenting with low pollution vehicles, et cetera. These guys are good. They are the world leaders in vehicle technology, et cetera. So this one hasn't caught their attention the way I would hope it does, so I do things like this today to try to help raise the, but it is really the cleanest technology. I don't want to insult anybody by saying one can be fooled by the biodiesel alternative, but we can be. The biodiesel that is being put in trucks now is B20, which means it's 80% diesel. It is effectively filling the truck with diesel. If it's a 50 gallon tank, you're putting 40 gallons of diesel in 20 eventually. Right? The electric vehicle, they're lovely, I've seen them. They're years away. I mean, maybe next year you could get a, a dozen. I don't know, maybe the year after that you get two dozen. But the natural gas vehicles that are available now, they are 50% of the market in America. We should be using them. I don't work for any natural gas. I hear that. No, no, don't worry about it. We have the whole, if you build it, they will come situation. It's almost, I talked to the commissioner. She said, look, if we had 50 fueling stations around the city of New York during like a winter snowstorm, I'd feel more comfortable having natural gas trucks. But um, I don't have time to, to go only to the Bronx and then all the way to New Jersey to fuel my trucks during like a winter storm. So, Absolutely, I've so, had that conversation with her by the all way. Right, so, but it doesn't mean that it, we, we knock it completely. I think that there's an opportunity to have a conversation about what the future looks like because eventually yes. someone's gonna figure this out and why not start it now, so. Yes, and, really and one it. other detail I mentioned. Yeah, sure. They spend between 50 and 100 million dollars a year building stations, building and rebuilding, and most of the trucks in New York are refilled at home at the station. They're refilled because diesel pumps are put in and tanks are put in with every rebuild or every new station. Natural gas uh, fuel can be put in. Fueling capacity could be put in. That's a lot of money. It's dozens of millions of dollars a year to build or upgrade state uh, truck depots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. You were actually the first name called. Go for it. Go, go for it. I'll go last. That's okay. Um, I'm, a, I'm going to echo a lot of what uh, Brendan just said. Um, thank you to the committee for giving me this chance to testify. I am speaking on behalf of Energy Vision, a 501c3 environmental group that um, is a recognized expert on alternative vehicle fuels. Um, when you mentioned that uh, you suspected the Department of Sanitation was the most polluting of the agencies, according to New York City's 2015 Clean Fleet Report, you are correct. On all scores, greenhouse gas emissions or GHGs, particulate matter and nitrogen oxides, they lead the way. Um, that report called uh, climate change an existential threat and set a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, or GHGs, from city fleets 80% by 2035. Um, if you do an analysis of, that, analysis of that plan, it becomes clear that achieving that target requires a major shift away from diesel fuel by the city fleets. Uh, city diesel vehicles consume 60% of all the fuel and emit 63% of the GHGs. The Department of Sanitation has the largest number of heavy vehicles and uses the most fuel. 
while they're a recognized leader in testing new truck technologies and use biodiesel blends and have a modest number of compressed natural gas trucks, um, they still use more than 10 million gallons of diesel fuel a year, making them the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, NOx, and particulate matter. Um, natural gas, as Brendan mentioned, is a cost-effective and environmentally advantageous fueling option for refuse trucks, and fast-fill CNG technology is common, by the way. Um, over 50% of new refuse trucks in the country use natural gas. The greenhouse gas emissions are 22% lower. By expanding its use of CNG trucks and infrastructure, DSNY would open the door for two other ultra-clean technologies, biomethane fuel and near-zero emission engines. Biomethane is made by refining biogases from decomposing organic wastes. It's also called renewable natural gas, and it can be used in any natural gas vehicle. In heavy-duty vehicles, it has GHG emissions 70% or more lower than diesel fuel and 40% or more lower than fossil gas. When it's made from food waste, it can actually be net carbon negative, meaning that its production prevents more greenhouse gas emissions than it releases when it's combusted. It's being used by refuse haulers like for public services and waste management. Private haulers in California use the waste they collect to produce fuel for their trucks, and the cities of Vancouver, Toronto, Los Angeles, and Portland are developing similar closed loop projects for fueling their municipal fleets. The organic waste streams that DSNY works so hard to collect could be converted to biomethane. Our residential and commercial food waste combined could produce enough biomethane to displace all the, all the diesel used by New York City's fleets, um, again creating a closed loop. Heavy vehicles that can use biomethane can also be fitted with readily available off-the-shelf EPA-certified near-zero engines, which cut health-damaging nitrogen oxides and particulate matter 90% below EPA requirements. And this would particularly benefit the often poorer neighborhoods that house many DSNY garages. The combination of biomethane and near-zero engines is a clean fuel solution that's available today we encourage the committee to urge DSNY to pursue available zero and near zero emission technologies, including biomethane and near zero engines. Without a major shift in vehicle and fuel procurement by DSNY, the city is going to be hard, placed, hard pressed to meet its sustainability and 80 by 35 goals. Thank you for that information, for sure. So I appreciate it. Kendall? Council member, nice to see you again uh, today. Hope your uh, mother enjoyed seeing your baby last night. Yeah, she did. It was Good. great. <laughs> um, so my name is Kendall Christensen. I'm executive director of New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management. You have a written statement for me that I will briefly uh, summarize. Uh, the first part of it uh, uh, was uh, two points that essentially affirm uh, and applaud the, the new BIC. Uh, the industry has been enthusiastic and working uh, uh, aggressively and actively with uh, BIC leadership over the last couple of years through the Trade Waste Advisory Board, the uh, emphasis on safety, a variety of initiatives coming out of that. And also, as the Commissioner Brownell suggested, uh, it's time to update, modernize the 20-year-old uh, collection of regulations that BIC has developed over time. Uh, that no longer really serve uh, the same purpose that they may have uh, might have done 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, uh, and there's a lot more that could be done if they had the resources to do that. Um, so the related part of my budget, the budget part of my testimony on that calls for Vic to get another million dollars, and I picked that number out of the air just to give you something to anchor on, uh, and that could be used for industry initiatives could be used for better an analysis of the, all the data that BIC collects that it currently does not have the staff capacity to do anything with. Uh, they are an enormous consumer of data uh, from the industry, uh, but we get very little of it back in terms of useful information, uh, particularly on a timely basis that uh, will help us uh, make uh, data-driven decisions on a going forward basis. The second part of my testimony is about where that million dollars might come from. And let me just uh, say simply that that ought to come from the $8 million contract that DSNY's consultants are using 
to, uh, to plan their commercial waste uh, zone system. Uh, and the reason you don't need to uh, spend all that money is because you have a real world laboratory to look at in Los Angeles uh, that is, uh, as of last July, implementing a similar scheme to what has been proposed uh, for New York. Uh, and if you've seen any of the headlines, any of the editorials, uh, I was out uh, about a month ago for a six hour city council meeting with about 300 participants who were not happy. Uh, it's been an unmitigated disaster. Uh, tens of thousands of service disruptions over the last six months of implementation. Uh, the business community thought that prices might go up modestly 30 or 40 percent and when they started getting bills in July and August during the transition period, uh, the bills were doubling, tripling, quadrupling and more. Uh, lots of extra service charges for special uh, services that used to be included in the prices. And now the uh, city council and administration in LA are trying hard to figure out how to clean up that mess, uh, and in some cases, uh, even trying to figure out how to unwind uh, that system. Um, so my testimony speaks a little bit uh, more to that uh, issue, and I'm sure we'll have a robust uh, discussion about that. And I guess the, the, the other point I would make about that is that the uh, you know, Commissioner Garcia made the point about wanting a uh, system that is uh, high performing and low cost. And that's pretty much what its consultants found in their 2016 report, is that New York has a very competitive and effective uh, commercial waste uh, management system that isn't broken, uh, that provides a high level of customer satisfaction at a competitively uh, low price, uh, and that's at risk of being disrupted for not really any good reason. I appreciate the discussion about VMTs, but just to that point, uh, 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 Mr. Chairperson, um, the DSNY's consultants have decided to go back to the drawing board and take in fresh data rather than using stale, data, stale and inaccurate and uh, incomplete data from 2014 that's already ancient history. So just uh, literally as we speak, the industry has been asked to provide uh, fresh data about uh, routing and collections and materials and tonnages and the like to be used to inform the, uh, the advisory process. Uh, but that's seven months into the, uh, the work that they began uh, at the end of last summer. Uh, and so we're so almost back to square one and looking at uh, whether or not there are really uh, the VMT reduction efficiencies that uh, the consultants had, uh, and others had sort of claimed that there are, or whether the industry is already operating uh, quite efficiently. Uh, not, it's not perfect, and it will never be perfect in a city like New York, but as the Commissioner Garcia noted, you've really got 20 companies that provide 80 to 85 percent of the service at present. So it's already a highly consolidated industry, a lot of professionalism. Um, the, those companies, and those are the primarily the ones that I work with and represent, uh, again, are the active participants in the process that Commissioner Bernal outlined. And we look forward to working with uh, BIC in particular as they uh, 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 enter that, uh, that new BIC uh, phase that we t you talked about earlier. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to limit our, my, my comments or my uh, back and forth because I know we're going to have a hearing on all this information in the future and we could talk there. But I do believe, um, you know, I disagree with many statements that you made, um, especially like what's the need considering, you know, the wages and the safety concerns that we have in the city of New York related to uh, the commercial waste industry. I don't think that's n not any reason. Um, uh, also, the vehicles miles traveled, you know, I'll be hard pressed to see a number that'll be, uh, like, th that'll show uh, a level of efficiency from the 2014 numbers, even though that, that data, as you claim, as you've stated, um, is either incomplete or, 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 or different now. Um, we're talking about a, a 50, 60 percent, it said 50 percent conservatively. Let's say it's even 30 percent, which is what I thought it was going to be when, I, when the study first came out. I thought it was going to be like 25 percent, and then I saw 50 and, and 60 and all these numbers. But regardless, the, I think that you should also hold judgment regarding what the study is going to bring out regarding the vehicles miles traveled and not claim that a system is efficient when a prior study that has, okay, incomplete information has stated that it's been extremely inefficient. We've also had huge, huge stories written in the New York Times and other, art and other publications here in the city of New York regarding how workers are treated in, um, in this industry and the race to the bottom that um, the commercial waste uh, industry had um, 
uh, is known for, let's say. So I just, I just think that, you know, the way you frame it kind of just uh, glosses over the inefficiencies of this industry that you think works so perfectly well. Um, you just sit, stand on Metropolitan and Manhattan Ave in my district and, and tell me that these trucks are perfectly fine. We also know that these trucks are running in 10, 15, 20 years old in some cases, and we do have a piece of legislation that is gonna come, that is gonna deal with that issue, but we're talking about um, needing to legislate responsible purchasing of trucks and, and not using them uh, beyond their half-life. So I, I just don't want you to completely dismiss the concerns we have in the commercial waste industry, and, and just, I, I just really think you're, you're, it's way too glossy the way, the way you're presenting it, and I don't well, think it's I'm, fair. I'm glad to have that discussion with you on all those issues. Uh, I guess I would say simply that you know, our view is that the goals of the city are worth achieving with the collaboration and partnership with the industry, but can be achieved sooner, better, and cheaper than waiting five years for a zone and franchising system to be implemented that may or may not work here. Um, so there's lots that's already being done, lots that more that could be done. I'll pick up on the theme of the, the uh, clean trucks. I sent Commissioner Brownell a letter a couple weeks ago saying that we've had an industry working group discussion on electric trucks. Uh, and have a number of companies that are prepared to pull the trigger on testing electric trucks in the city on the commercial waste side, but won't do it because they don't know if their companies are gonna be in existence three to five years from now. They're not willing to make that investment now given the uncertainties that's being created around franchising. And that's just one example of the kinds of investments in capital and, uh, and both human and physical capital that are not being made in the industry now because of the uncertainties associated with the, uh, uh, the threat of uh, zoning and franchising. Uh, that, that, that excuse about not, wanting, not willing to invest because of, of um, legislation or regulation has been used for b even before I was here. When Council Member Diana Reno was here, it's always their excuse. We won't want it, we can't do it because we don't know. We can't do it because we don't know. Well, guess what, if all your trucks met uh, guidelines, let's say the way uh, the Department of Sanitation guidelines are regarding like um, emissions, then we wouldn't need to pass the legislation that was passed during Council Member Reno's time that gave you guys 10 years to well, get trucks that, that at 2007. Well, that goes into next year, as Commissioner Brunel said, so that's already happening. But uh, it's happening uh, because we legislated trucks. it, not um, because you took the, the initiative. Yes, but many of the companies are already making those investments your, with the new trucks and your in, industry and in trucks. I would say your industry has never taken on any task to advance itself on many issues ever in its history without us threatening with legislation or some type of reform. It always comes from the city council and then you guys show up. The safety issue didn't happen until now you have a symposium. Thank you very much. We've been asking for that for decades or not even decades, let's say four years since I've been here only. I hold myself accountable, not previous administrations. But more than four years ago, I, we were talking about safety concerns, and now you see that there might be some authority given to BIC, or there might be a, um, that people are dying, and, and we're paying attention to it. Uh, now you have a safety manual or a symposium that you're putting together. Um, your trucks are terrible. We, we, we say we're gonna pass legislation, you actually convinced council members back then to give you 10 years to get trucks to be at a 2009 level, I think it is, right? Not trucks, we're not talking about you getting trucks that'll be like 2017 trucks, 2018 trucks. It's all about getting 2007 trucks because you got 1980 trucks um, that probably still exist in, in your streets. I, I pushed it there. But the point that I'm making is if it doesn't come from us, if we are not threatening you with legislation or introducing reform, you never, ever step up. So we have to help you step up. I just want to say oh, that. I so this, this whole theory about, so. about not knowing and the regulation holding you back, I, 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 call, I call BS on that. I really do. I'm sorry. And, and kind of it ha it's happened constantly. Every time that I ask you guys to do something, it takes legislation for you guys to take it seriously. Well, my point was about the uh, uh, the looking ahead to innovation in the field, and there are a variety of innovation. companies that are interested in innovation. Why not do truck innovation, innovation before that legislation? To make that investment. The legislation in regarding the emissions that you're supposed to, uh, yes. that I think applies in 2019. End of, end of 2019. There was opportunities for you to take on innovation during that time. We've also had conversations about voluntary decrease in capacity by, th for the industry and that they were gonna take that on. They never took it on, so we have, we're pushing intro 495 is another example of that. There's always been opportunities for you to step up and do the right thing so that we don't need to regulate you, and it never happens, ever. 
That's all I'm saying. So yes, you have your concerns and we want to help you address them as best as possible, but it's been, om it's been a almost exclusively city council legislation and regulation that has brought you to the new, to the new era. Um, and I just, I just wish that one time that wouldn't be the case and it, it's never happened. Again, I don't share that perspective, but I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Kendrick. Good afternoon. Um, uh, Chairman Reynoso, I continue to be impressed by your leadership, and I thank you for raising the issue of the ways of the waste industry. Um, I would just, at the risk of uh, correcting you on one point, I would just add that it's not just the council, but it's the communities on the front lines of the waste industry's facilities and infrastructure that really pushed the council to address the dangerous and hazardous and life-threatening conditions under which they exist. Um, but that said, I'm not gonna take my time to sort of reiterate many of the things that you said. I would just make that one little eensy weensy correction and then you would be completely fabulous in my eyes <laughs> and I would have nothing else to say. No, um, I'm Cecil Corbin Mark. I'm the Deputy Director of We Act for Environmental Justice and uh, We Act's mission is to build healthy communities by ensuring that people of color and low, income and low income residents participate meaningfully in the creation of sound and fair environmental health and practice protection policies and practices, sorry. We organize residents across four community boards, 9, 10, 11, and 12 in Northern Manhattan, and we are a membership organization with almost 700 members who live and work and vote uptown. Today I'm here, we have a long history. I've given you a, a written testimony. I'm going to uh, forego one of these paragraphs here, but we have a long history of really saying no more diesel in our communities. We be fighting diesel around the diesel buses and bus depots in communities of West Central East Harlem, along with Washington Heights and Inwood for many, many years because we were home to more than one third of the nation's largest diesel fleets. Um, along the way, we act with several other organizations, some of whom are here today and others not, can be really proud of the efforts to clean up the bus fleet. Um, and while it's not perfect and there's way more to be done and there's sometimes backsliding, um, we can all look to the fact that in Northern Manhattan there are ultra low sulfur electric hybrid diesel buses running on the streets. Um, we fought for government uh, regulation at the federal level for ultra low sulfur diesel. Um, we worked on getting uh, bus depots like the Mother Clara Hale bus depot converted to one of the greenest bus depots in the nation. And so that's our track record on working on these issues. Today I wanted to focus more about some of the other city fleets um, and to offer two reasons that we need to phase out the procurement of vehicles that use diesel for the sanitation's medium and heavy duty fleets. We believe that this step is needed to get northern Manhattan neighborhoods and other environmental justice communities communities like your community across the city to have better air quality, mitigate the contributions to the cl uh, climate crisis, and improve health outcomes. In northern Manhattan, several of our sanitation truck depots, the East Harlem CB11 and the Washington Heights Inwood CB12 depots, play host of vehicles that service the Upper East Side and are supposed uh, and these vehicles are supposed to be in those neighborhoods under the city's regulations. Uh, of course, that's one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the entire nation, and we have no doubt about why it is that those vehicles ended up in our neck of the woods, in El Barrio and Washington Heights Inwood in particular. Um, we act believes that the proximity of these diesel vehicles to the places where children, seniors, and those with medically diagnosed respiratory illnesses only further exacerbate negative health outcomes in our communities. Um, we act has worked with the residents of Northern Manhattan to get these depots moved and or improved and to ensure that vehicles for the Upper East Side are placed in those neighborhoods and not dumped in ours. The reason that we've been so keen about this uh, is because co-pollutants that come along with the burning of diesel, like PM 2.5, particulate matter of a 2.5 microns, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, those things not only impact health in a negative way, they can actually rob people of their lives and longevity. This is based on research that WEACT Act has been engaged in with the Columbia University's uh, Children's Center at the Mailman School of Public Health. We've had a partnership with them for more than two decades and have produced a number of research studies um, that indicate that PAHs and PM 2.5 can reduce the circumference 
size of a child's head, um, thus leading in later on in life to learning disabilities and other kinds of neurological impacts. Um, we've also known that PM 2.5 triggers asthma, um, as well as other respiratory illnesses. We urge this committee to address those citing issues that provide a disproportionate burden on some communities that play host to diesel heavy duty, uh, medium and heavy duty fleets like street sweepers and trucks. And at the same time, we need to eliminate or significantly reduce the dirty emissions from the city's diesel fleets to improve the air that those New Yorkers that live closest to those depots breathe. We think our path to cleaning up those fleets is to commit as a city to saying no more diesel. There are reliable alternatives to diesel that are non-fossil fuel based, and we, the communities on the front line of the climate crisis and the asthma epidemic and other negative health outcomes need that change now. Second, uh, the city has set ambitious greenhouse gas reduction goals and clean air goals, and we've been a part of the process of helping them arrive at some of those goals. We've sat on task forces, uh, sustainability, work advisory groups, et cetera, and we support them in moving forward in this endeavor. It's sad to say, however, that despite some of this goal setting and these aims, uh, the idea of cutting greenhouse gas by 80% in the city's fleets by 2035 from 2005 levels is not something that we are actually on a good glide path to achieve. Uh, similarly, uh, being the largest uh, city with the, big, the best air uh, or major city in the US by 2050 is also seemingly not on a good glide path as well. Um, but if they continue to buy medium and heavy duty uh, trucks powered by diesel or diesel biodiesel fuel, we don't think that that is going to get any better. In fact, we think that's going in the wrong direction. And if we're serious about protecting vulnerable communities from the ravages of another Superstorm Sandy or worse, if we're really committed to leading on the sustainability goals, and if we're serious about protecting the health and life expectancy of these communities, then we need to start by phasing out the procurements of diesel sanitation vehicles. Um, we can certainly talk for much longer about these issues and happy to be here along with people like Brendan uh, who served the city well and is in private practice now for a very long time um, and my other colleagues at this table, Kenneth and uh, Mr. Phil Voss who I'm meeting I think for the first time. So thanks and thanks for your leadership. Yes. Thank what you and just, huh? What he said. <laughs> You paid him to say that. I know you did. Uh, um, <laughs> you're imputing my reputation on a public and my, record. And I apologize for that. But I do want to. I do want to just. I got the rumor that I have money to give away. I, I do want to say that um, all, all the the progress that we've made as a city, um, as a city council, um, those ideas and those the and the ideas and changes that we've seen does come from advocacy from communities. It wasn't born through council members. Those ideas always come to us from somewhere else, and there's usually folks on the ground. So I agree 100%. Thank you. Um, it just we we simply have the authority to make those ideas law, and and that we've implemented it that way. So I do agree with you. Trust me. I appreciate um, that. Uno and, and outrage and NOPI and the Transform the Trash Coalition. We act. All these organizations have, have come together to fight a lot of these environmental concerns and issues, um, and it is because of them that we've seen a lot of these changes. So you are correct. <laughs> this this diesel this diesel conversation, I guess it's it's I'm hearing the the, the chorus is growing, um, and I want to see if I can have a serious conversation with the the, the administration, right? Not the Department of Sanitation. Um, I think the administration really needs to pay attention to this to see if we could have that conversation more seriously. But right now, there is a lot of pushback, not only from the administration and the agency, but from the city council uh, and, and members that don't necessarily see the value, right, um, value added. Uh, they're not all environmentalists, trust me. Um, I so, figured that out. <laughs> uh, uh, so I want to I wanna see what that looks like moving forward, maybe paying more attention to it this year. I remember... This has been something that's brought to me every single year, and I, I just respect the experience and the knowledge and the expertise of the commissioner um, that if she that she can't do this because when she says she can't do it, it's because she can't do it. But I think that at this point, we, we just have to be more creative. We have to be we have to be stronger. Um, I would say I, just in response to that, I would say that I totally. I mean, we have a, a wonderful relationship with uh, Commissioner Catherine Garcia. Um, and have worked with her on a number of different issues, uh, not the least of which around this. But I think that 
sometimes when it comes to these issues, yes, we understand sort of operational necessities. No one wants to be, you know, in a community where, you know, a snowplow can't get through in, in the aftermath of, you know, one of these nor'easters, right? Um, but at the same time, I think leadership does have to come from the council. Leadership does have to come from the administration, and so I applaud you for wanting to reach out to them and figuring out if there's a way in which we can set that sort of moonshot, right, which even at this point is not that much of a moonshot anymore, um, but that's the way I think government works best in terms of moving sort of the, the various sort of parts of government to achieve loftier, more important uh, goals for the benefit of all of us. And I think that's what needs to happen here. Right. Um, if I may, I'd just also like to note that in its 2015 um, Clean Fleet RFI, DCAS spoke of spending $6 billion on improving fleet sustainability. So that, you know, go, that has been put out there. But, but when you look at the, the, uh, the PMMR in regards to the, the purchasing of, of, of vehicles for sanitation, I think it's almost exclusively diesel trucks. And, and we're talking about a handful of uh, natural gas vehicles uh, and, and uh, the increase for, from year to year uh, as to how many natural gas trucks we've expanded within the fleet. Uh, it either stays the same or actually goes down. Um, there's not been a, like I a, think it's a, actually shrunk slightly. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that we're definitely not taking the natural gas movement seriously, um, and we're just reverting back to, to what we know, what we're comfortable with. And um, as sanitation chair for the last four years, um, the one thing that the Department of Sanitation um, is is uh, a creature of habit, and, and it does not want to change, and it hates to change. Um, and, and this is an example of that. And it's been very, it's like turning a very large ship here uh, in the work that I think actually Captain Garcia and myself are trying to do, right? I think that we're both trying to change the future of sanitation, but because we're talking about boats that are like, uh, that are like rusted in at the moment and then just trying to remove them and replace them is not easy. So um, there's a level of patience that needs to happen to see change, but you're right. Uh, the, there's been no serious, I don't think, effort uh, to modify this, the diesel crisis, I guess. If I can speak again for a minute, I just, for the second time, wish I was saying what Cecil does finish saying, because he's perfect on these. Uh, I mean, the, the, his organization is great. We Act is great. They have been for a long time. And it shows. His stuff is real. I also want to sympathize with Catherine. I mean, uh, that's a tough job. And she has a lot on her plate. And she has many, many issues to cope with. It's possible, because you are the committee that's interested in diesel uh, trucks, you have heard a lot about this, so therefore she's heard a lot about it. Maybe the city should, some, the administration should take it. The Department of Transportation runs a lot of very big uh, uh, equipment. Department of Parks has its own trucks, collection, sanitation vehicles, as well as others. M maybe we have to find uh, DDC, Department of Design and Construction. What are their specs for their contractors who come in and build city property? What kind of heavy duty exhaust are those guys spelting? Maybe we have to find a way to broaden the conversation so that the Department of Sanitation, which includes some of the most supremely talented vehicle engineers, and by the way, environmentally oriented vehicle operators and purchasers, maybe if we can take some of the heat off or make it more general and make it a city issue or more of a city issue would help a little because she's obviously a, a, a brilliant and dedicated commissioner. She just is, and her staff is magnificent. So we got to figure out a way to make it easier to move this issue. I hear you should go to the state and fight the MTA and all their diesel buses because they actually have electric buses that actually work, and instead they just flood the streets and reissue contracts for diesel buses, which makes no sense when they know they can happen. But. Um, I want to thank everyone for today. Um, this was a good hearing, hopefully, to, uh, for you. You'll be the ones that make uh, that assess that. But uh, thank you so much, and this meeting is now adjourned.